representatives of the citizens of the City of Brisbane are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make today. Amen. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respect to Elders past and present. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open. Are there any apologies? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks, Chair. I wish to advise that Councillor Cook will be absent for the duration of the meeting and move that she be granted a leave of absence. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Griffiths, that Councillor Cook be granted a leave of absence from today's meeting. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Any other apologies? Councillor Landers. Um, I move that the Lord Mayor uh, be granted leave of absence from today's meeting. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Hutton, that the Lord Mayor be granted a leave of absence from today's meeting. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, no. The ayes have it. Any others? No. Councillors, confirmation of minutes, please. Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,633rd meeting held on Tuesday, 10th of November 2020 be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Hutton, that the minutes of the 4,633rd meeting of Council held on the 10th of November 2020 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, I draw to your attention our public participant for today, Mr Robin Town, who will be discussing the St Lucia Bowling Club with us. Mr Town. Now, uh, Mr Town, you have five minutes commencing when you begin. Uh, I note that you have asked for some documents to be um, made available to councillors. As there are only two, they'll be tabled and councillors can be able to look at them across the meeting. Uh, at their convenience. Mr Town. Okay. Mr Chair, Deputy Mayor and councillors, thanks for the opportunity to address you this afternoon. I'll be brief and hopefully to time. Um, I want to talk to you about the St Lucia Bowling Club, uh, the club which I'm currently president. And uh, what I'll do, a little bit of brief history about the club, uh, a bit about our operations and, and financial performance. Um, how we've gone through the COVID-19 period, uh, a bit about BCC support, it's very important to us, and some comments on our future challenges. So, first of all, the club was founded in 1947 uh, on the site where it currently is at Carr Street at St Lucia near the University of Queensland, on council property that was provided uh, for our use back then in 1947. 1949, the first green was ready to play and uh, that had cost £1,595. And the club bought an old army hut at that stage for £70 and that became the clubhouse. It's now our machinery shed. In 1949, they got their priorities right and uh, applied for a liquor licence. Got that in place and opened for play in 1949, opened by the Lord Mayor at that time, J.B. Chandler. One year later in 1950, the Ladies Club was formed. I note that that was only agreed to by a vote of 24 to 19. So, <laughs> says something about the boys in those days. In 1954, our new clubhouse was built and it was extended various times thereafter with council assistance. The club has progressed through all these years and it wasn't until 2016 that we amalgamated the men's and the ladies' clubs and got under one constitution. That delay, incidentally, was more to do with the ladies not wanting to do it than the men. Uh, initial membership, 78 members, grew to about 220 in the 1970s and is now at 170. Um, so we've sort of held our own, but we really need to, uh, to gain members, and I'll say a little more about that. Our purpose is really about supporting the, the sport of lawn bowls and promoting it. We exist for the, for the benefit of our members, which is very important. We could provide a community hub, and we must remain financially viable. A bit about our club operation and finances. Um, 
we place a great um, deal of importance on having high quality greens. If you're going to play bowls, you want to be on good greens. So that's very important to us. We want to develop bowling skills amongst our members so we become better bowlers and can compete. We like to have promote competition both intra-club and inter-club with many of the other clubs in the Brisbane district. We have social bowls for those who don't want to compete and we currently play four days a week. Our club is sort of built around the fact that our membership and green fees must be fairly low to encourage people to play. But the income from membership and green fees basically supports the maintenance of our greens. Um, function income supports you know, our admin costs and facility improvements. And we have a reliance somewhat on grants for making major improvements to the club and facilities. We're a pure bowling club. We don't have any pokies, we don't do meals, we've got a nice clubhouse and we have a bar. Um, we have very limited paid staff, so we pay a greenkeeper and we pay a student to be a bar attendant two afternoons a week for three hours. Other than that, we operate on a, totally on a volunteer basis. So that means you know, a fair bit of work from the members around supervising functions and things. And for example, a Monday crew, we call the Monday crew, five, six guys who come every Monday from 7 a.m. till 11 a.m., mow the grass, do the gardens and all that sort of stuff. Three of those six are over 85. So as you can imagine, there'd be a bit of competition for the ride on mower on a Monday morning. The, our financials, we turn over about $150,000, $175,000 a year. We spend about $75,000 a year on greens, upkeep and maintenance and improvement. About $15,000 on our facilities maintenance. Six grand on water. Um, and we need to get about $30,000 from external functions to support any improvements we want to make to the club. As an example, Last year we air-conditioned our clubhouse at a cost of $35,000, which was all self-funded. Uh, Mr is... Town, I'm going to have to stop you there at your five-minute mark. Um, oh, please... sorry. That's all right. That's all right. Please, um, if you take a seat, I think I'm going to call on Councillor Howard to respond to you. Councillor Howard. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to thank Mr Town for taking the time to come and speak to us to today. And on behalf of Council, I would like to say thank you to the St Lucia Bowls Club for all the wonderful work that you do for the local community in St Lucia. And uh, I know that it's been a, a very tough year for everyone and I, I can hear from your comments that uh, some of your volunteers would be what is being termed the vulnerable group. So again, it makes it difficult when uh, you're dependent on volunteers. And I can hear though uh, the pride with which you uh, talk about the club. And I think to, uh, to know that since uh, um, 1947, there has been a club there is really something to be so proud of and to uh, thank you very much for that ongoing commitment. Um, so as, as I've said, the St Lucia Bowls Club certainly is an institution for the local area and we are proud to support the Bowls Club through not only the lease but also many grants that the Council has provided over the years. I was very pleased to hear that you were able to benefit from the $10,000 um, COVID-19 assistance, direct assistance program to cover some of the operational expenses. We know that's helped a lot of clubs and I'm pleased to hear that yours was one of them. I also know that um, in particular Councillor Mackay has been a great advocate and support to the St Lucia Bowls Club by providing many grants through the Lord Mayor's Community Fund and it's also great to hear that this support has helped your club improve and make improvements that will have a lasting impact into the future. It's very pleased to hear that the boys and the girls got it all sorted out and that you all now play together because I again know how important it is to have uh, the teams uh, attend and to play at the bowls club and I, I know that we have many bowls clubs right across Brisbane and uh, I just once again want to thank you for your commitment and to your team for their commitment and thank you once again for coming to speak to us today at Council. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Thank you, Mr Town. Mr Piers will assist you. Councillors will now move to question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or Chair of any of the Standing Committees? Councillor Hutton. 
My question is to the Acting Mayor. Councillor Adams, the Prime Minister is today meeting with the President of the International Olympic Committee in Tokyo to push for, the Brisbane, for Brisbane to host the Olympic Games in 2032. Can you please outline Brisbane's firm commitment for the Games to proceed here? Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair, and I thank Councillor Hutton for the question, because not only is the Schrinner administration still 100 per cent behind a bid for the 2032 Olympics to be held here in Brisbane, we need the Olympics to be held here to help that economic recovery of our city. As Councillor Hutton mentioned, uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison is today meeting with the IOC President, Thomas Bach, in Tokyo, and it's fantastic to see the federal government is continuing to throw their support behind this bid. Following the release of the Council of Mayors of South East Queensland feasibility report in February of last year by then Lord Mayor Graham Quirk, we have been pushing full steam ahead. The Lord Mayor met with the IOC President and the AOC President John Coates last year, and back then the IOC President was enthusiastic in his support. The IOC has been a major long-term supporter of the work done by the mayors in our region. Of course, after initially giving a tepid response, the Queensland Premier is now supportive of the Olympic Games being held here too in 2032. This Games being held here would be a jobs bonanza for Brisbane and South East Queensland, with the Australian Olympic Committee estimating up to 10,000 full-time employees in South East Queensland alone. A 2032 Olympics in Queensland would accelerate much-needed transport infrastructure, including duplicating the Gold Coast section of the M1. And the Council of Mayors have made no secret about the fact that this journey was started four years ago as a way to deliver the infrastructure investment to manage the region's growing population. There is no argument that this infrastructure investment needs to happen regardless of the Olympics Games. We undertook a region-wide transport roadmap to identify the major projects needed to keep our residents and businesses moving, to keep Brisbane and Queensland moving. It's now more important than ever, given our current economic situation. The initial roadmap identified a delivery of 47 critical projects. Between now and 2041, we need to make sure we can get on track, including a fast rail network for South East Queensland. With Brisbane suburbs, we recognise our planned projects will go a long way to delivering better public transport for the Olympics and just for getting people home quicker and safer, including the Eastern Busway to Cooparoo, Camp Hill, Carina, Carindale, Chandler and Capalabar. The Northern Busway, expanded from Kedron to Bracken Ridge, and servicing suburbs including Chermside, Aspley, Castledine and Bracken Ridge. Future expansion of the Brisbane Metro to the northern and eastern suburbs. The North West Transport, Transport Network and new green bridges connecting suburbs like Tawong, St Lucia and West End, and Albion to Newstead and of course Kangaroo Point to the CBD. The Council of Mayors started this journey as a way to bring all levels of government to commit to transport investment in our region and to establish a firm delivery deadline to turn our planning into action. Our Olympic feasibility demonstrated that Brisbane and the South East Queensland region has the potential to mount a successful Games bid that could deliver the public transport, road upgrades and bridges we need as a growing area. An Olympic game presents a compelling pro proposition for the South East and Queensland as a whole, given the international exposure and widespread economic, social and cultural benefits it's delivered, it would deliver. We need to remember it's not just about where the events are held. Countries obviously from, from east to west and north to south across the globe will come to train in Queensland. Those training regions can be in Cairns, Townsville, Longreach, Mount Isa, the South East Queensland region, definitely, but right along the coast where we can have hubs of countries training and of course acclimatising to our beautiful weather as we lead into the Olympics. And of course those athletes, coaches, trainers there putting money into the pockets of our businesses in Queensland. Most importantly for the Council of Mayors, it creates the strong impetus needed to ensure the delivery of our regional transport roadmap through the South East Queensland City deal. Before we can bid for an Olympic Games, our governments need to work in partnership with the Australian Olympic Committee to have a robust look at not just the cost, but the benefits of the Olympic Games. We stand ready at South East Queensland Council of Mayors 
behind the Premier and the Prime Minister to make sure that this opportunity comes to fruition in 2032 for the benefit of all Queenslanders. Further questions? Councillor uh, Cumming. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, my question is to the Deputy Lord Mayor and Chair of City Planning. There's been a very controversial development application in Tingalpa with plans to rip up the Brisbane Polo grounds and replace them with a massive transport depot. Locals were outraged and at first council rejected the DA. It went to the Planning Environment Court and months later the DA is now suddenly approved. The LNP councillor for that ward, Lisa Atwood, publicly opposed the development from the start to save face with the community and blamed the approval on the court. She said, and I quote, Council's refusal of the Brisbane Polo Grounds pr proposal followed significant community feedback and to say I'm frustrated and disappointed with the Council's approval <laughs> would be an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> however, we've since, let's, however, we've since learnt this is fake news and it was not the Court's decision at all. The Planning Environment Court approved the development because the parties, the Brisbane City Council and the developer agreed that it should proceed. Agreed. Councillor Adams, Agreed. you and your LNP team couldn't lie straight in bed. Why is Team Strinner saying one thing to the community's face but selling them out behind their backs? Yeah. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. And I'm happy to respond to this. Uh, this was an application that we did not support. Uh, it went out to full community consultation and... No, no interjections, please. Please, no, no, please allow the answer to be heard. Councillor Adams. And as Councillor coming in one part of the... some of the truth that was in that question, Councillor Atwood did a lot of work with her community to hear what they wanted and what they didn't want in this particular area. And it was very clear that a tra transport depot... No, please, councillors, uh, please allow the answer to be heard. Oh, Councillor Adams. Right? Yep, Councillor Adams, Thank proceed. Thank you. Uh, and as I said, the, uh, the, uh, the Global Councillor for the area worked very hard with her community and worked with council officers um, to explain that a transport depot was not something that they wanted to see. Uh, in this local area. We did not approve the uh, um, application as was actually mentioned. And we were sent to P&E Court. Well, we were taken to P&E Court by the applicants. Um, they appealed that decision. What I want to address in this chamber is exactly what happens in the P&E Court. No, no. Because no, what we hear no, from this side... Councillors, Councillor Adams, please. Uh, please allow the answer to be heard in silence. I appreciate the question was lengthy. It had many parts. Uh, the weather did interrupt it very briefly, so it wasn't heard totally in silence, but I'd like the answer to be heard. Uh, it is an important topic. Councillor Adams. Thank you. As I was saying, we're hearing the interjection from the other side as you are trying to uh, explain to them that when we get to P&E Court, there is a very set process of what we go through. We were very frustrated on the court's approval, and I can say on behalf of... No, 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 no. Count, Councillor Johnston, I've, I've asked for silence a number of occasions. Uh, please allow the answer to be heard. Councillor Adams. When we go into P&E court, and Councillor Johnston, I know, has been there in a case... Please proceed. No, Councillor Johnston, no, Councillor Johnston um, I've, I've actually named you. I've, I've asked the room to be quiet for the answer on a number of occasions. I have asked you directly, and Councillor Johnston, I consider, no, no, I'll be, I'll be reasonable on this. If you interject again, I'll go to the formal processes. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. As I said, when we go to court, there is a set process that you need to go through. And the very first thing that the court orders the lawyers in Brisbane City Legal Practice and the applicants that have actually applied is to go into mediation. The very first thing they say is to see if you can mediate this out. In most cases, that is not the case because that is what we have already been through in council. We've been through the application process where we came to come to an agreement with the uh, applicants and they did not want to do what we thought was best for the area. I have to absolutely refute the continual interjections we hear from this side about rolling over. And I want to apologise to the hard-working team in Brisbane City Council in appeals that stand up there and fight. 
Yeah, and councillors, I, I appreciate. I, I I do allow some level of interjection, but please allow, uh, please allow the uh, uh, acting Lord Mayor to be heard. And do fight to uphold the decisions by the independent town planners within council. But it does come to a stage where you are going to lose outright, or as you are ordered by the court, you need to negotiate a decision. And we will always try and get the best outcome for the community. If we believe we are going to hold the line and we are going to be able to uphold our position, we will fight. But if we know, I take offence from Councillor Johnston. Councillor Johnston, I've actually asked you to not interject on a number of occasions. Councillor Johnston, I consider that you are uh, displaying unsuitable meeting conduct and in accordance with section 21.5 of the Meetings Local Law 2001, I hereby request that you cease interjecting and refrain from doing this for the balance of the meeting. Councillor Adams. In this case, the situation was that we needed to negotiate a decision because it was not believed that we could un unfortunately win the Planning and Environment Court. We had to negotiate the best outcome for the community. We did not want to see what was put forward by the applicants happen in this area. And what the outcome was through that negotiated decision put on us by the courts was 56 new conditions through mediation that got a much better outcome than what the final uh, applicants' opportunities were when they were working with us in council. A 36,000 square metre environmental protection zone, significant planting uh, along the southern and western edges of the site to act as a buffer, selecting plants that will achieve full surface coverage within one year of planting, limiting the hours of operation, including commercial loading and unloading from 7am till 6pm, constructing a three metre wide pedestrian parkway, ensuring stormwater runoff and maintaining vegetation. A better outcome, not what we wanted to see, but a court-enforced negotiated outcome. Further questions? Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, Councillor Cunningham. Councillor Cunningham, can you please update the Chamber on Council's foreshore dog off-leash areas and our plans for them in future now that trial is ending? Councillor Cunningham. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to Councillor Davis for the question. One of the great things about living in Brisbane is our climate and lifestyle, which lends itself to enjoying the great outdoors. And this administration is committed to providing more for residents to see and do in our suburbs. We want residents to be able to enjoy a wide range of recreational activities right across our city. We're lucky in Brisbane to have diverse landscapes and environments to enjoy, from our suburban parks to riverside walks mountain outlooks and trails in our natural reserves. Our natural areas in particular make Brisbane unique. We are, after all, Australia's most biodiverse capital city. This administration is committed to growing and protecting our natural areas to create a cleaner and greener city for residents and wildlife. But we also want residents to be able to get out and enjoy natural areas with their family. And Mr Chair, that does also include our four-legged friends. As councillors would be aware, for the past year, Brisbane City Council, in collaboration with the Department of Environment and Science and the University of Queensland, has undertaken a one-year trial of foreshore dog off-leash areas, or FDOLAs, as we call them in council. This trial is about protecting migratory shorebirds, while also ensuring dog lovers and their pets can enjoy Brisbane's foreshore and residents can continue recreational activities such as kite surfing. Each year, over 40,000 migratory shorebirds arrive in the Moreton Bay region from countries such as Siberia, Korea, China and Japan to feed and to rest. Prior to the trial, there were no authorised dog off-leash areas along Brisbane's foreshore. Yet many pet owners were walking their dogs off leash in these areas. Council established three fedolas on Brisbane's foreshore at Sandgate, Nudgee Beach and Manly from October 2019. The trial locations were selected following careful research conducted by UQ. 
The Department of Environment and Science created draft guidelines for these dog off-leash areas in marine parks. The draft guidelines are based upon research published by UQ, which focused on ways that Brisbane shorebirds can actually be better protected. The research identified that with a foreshore zoning approach, shorebirds can be significantly better protected. So to trial these guidelines, Council and UQ entered into a shorebird conservation partnership led by the Queensland Government. Throughout the trial, UQ conducted shorebird monitoring and Council also engaged with residents to encourage responsible use of these fedolas. There are also three opportunities for the community to provide feedback via an online survey. After the one-year mark passed, Council analysed the data and insights from the shorebird monitoring and community feedback to determine a way forward. Mr Chair, I am pleased to announce today that Council's foreshore dog off-leash area trial sites in Sandgate and in Manly will remain in place. The Nudgee Beach foreshore dog off-leash area will return to a dog on-leash area and in the meantime, Council will investigate extending the current off-leash dog swimming area along Kedron Brook in nearby Tuckaroo Park at Nudgee Beach to the foreshore, providing more space for dogs to run off-leash and to swim. Nudgee Beach reported a higher risk to shorebirds due to disturbance by a larger number of dogs in that area. There will be a transition period at Nudgee Beach to ensure the community is aware that it will return to being an on-leash area and to direct park users to Tuckaroo Park for those wishing to take their dogs off-leash. Conversely, at Manly, it was reported that the potential disturbance to shorebirds was low before the trial, and it remained low throughout the trial. At Sandgate, while the number of foreshore users increased throughout the trial, the risk to shorebirds remained low. It was also noted that there were more people keeping their dogs on leash outside of the designated area. Continued education activities and compliance monitoring will further reduce the potential future interactions between shorebirds and dogs. I can also advise councillors that we're now looking at additional opportunities for water-based dog off-leash areas with their four-legged friends. The Fedola trial is another example of how this administration is working to find a balance between conservation and recreation. Councillor Cunningham, your time has expired. Are there any further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Acting Mayor. Uh, Councillor Adams, in uh, Councillor Cummings' previous question, he explained how an LNP councillor told a blatant mistruth to Brisbane residents regarding a controversial development. I have another example for you. In Norman Park, two character homes were demolished illegally. A development application for townhouses was then lodged for the site. Council rejected this DA initially. It went to the Planning Environment Court and now, years later, we find ourselves with that DA approved. The LNP planning chair said that Council and I, quote, flatly refused the approval of the townhouse project. We've since come to learn that Planning Environment Court approved the development because the parties, including Brisbane City Council, agreed that it should proceed and the court was not called upon to make any orders of its own. Now we're seeing the current LNP planning chair, you, acting mayor, do the same at a development on Richmond Road at Morningside. In July, Councillor Adams was quoted as saying, the application in its current form is not supported. Fast forward to this week and that DA has been approved. <laughs> Councillor Adams, how many other developments has this LNP told brazen untruths, fibs and porky pies about? Councillor Adams. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair, and I will I'll go through the process of the Planning and Environment Court again because it seems to be unclear from my first question on how this works. No, no, no interjections, please. Councillor Adams. We say no to applications. We are taken to the court by an applicant and we are directed by the court to negotiate. No, no, please, uh, this is clearly something of importance to the opposition. Please allow the answer to be heard. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. And the reality is, I'm sure enough of them have watched some TV shows occasionally here and there, that you win some and you lose some. 
And we have a pretty good track record of winning what we take to planning and environment court, I am proud to say. But unfortunately, we do not win all of them. And it becomes very clear... Councillor when... Cassidy, please allow the answer to be heard. Point, point of order, point Mr of order, Chairman. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Um, Mr Chairman, I am very concerned um, that what Councillor Adams is saying about the Supreme Court is incorrect and misleading. Okay. And uh, I say this, Mr Chairman, because the court does not order particular outcomes okay. when it look, is consent look, look, uh, order. Councillor Johnston, at this point, and it is and no, false this point, and this misleading. point of order is not is, is a speech. Is a speech not a? Uh, it's a, a speech, not a um, point of order, and therefore we will move on. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Councillor Johnston is not listening to me. I did not say. No, Councillor Johnston, please. Please allow the answer to be heard in silence. I've already um, identified your conduct as unsuitable. Please do not make me go through the process escalating it. Councillor Adams. I did not say that the court orders us to have uh, to for what the outcomes are, but they do tell us to negotiate. If we don't negotiate and they rule in favour again, uh, rule against us. We have Councillor Johnston. Councillor Johnston. Order, Mr. Chairman. Point of order. Point of order. No, hang on. no, no, no. I'm point speaking. Of order, Mr. No Chairman. point of orders while I'm speaking. Councillor Johnston, as you have failed to comply with the request to take remedial action for your unsuitable meeting conduct, I hereby warn you in accordance with section 21.7 of the Meetings Local Law 2001 that failing to comply with the request may result in an order being issued. Councillor Johnston, I believe you're about to ask me for a point of order. Yes, Mr Chairman. Um, this is absolutely inappropriate at, um, from Councillor Adams about the Planning and what's Environment the, what's, Court what's the nature is the, of the Supreme point of Court. Order? What is the point the of order? The court is not making rulings no, it, about no. this. Council What's is entering into consent. She is misleading about That's, the actions that is not a point of the order. Supreme What's the Court point of, order? of Queensland. No, yes, uh, it is, no, Mr Chairman. Find, and I would draw well, you to, I think it's Section look, 21. We have, we, have, we have work to do. So no, please, Mr please Chairman, it's about Section 21, as far uh, as I no, am... No, 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 Councillor Johnston, please, please retake your seat. We, we really need to... This is question time. Uh, you're chewing into important opportunities for the opposition to put scrutiny on the executive, I really think we need to move on. This is Please, about no, Councillor no, Adams no, being uh, inappropriate no, about no, the no, Supreme no. Court of Queensland. Councillor Adams, please continue your answer. This is just wrong. And the court's already written about this. When Councillor Adams. Councillor Johnston, if you do not, if you interject again, I will uh, be forced to note it in the minutes. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. When we go to Planning and Environment Court, our uh, application approval or if it's a refusal is either upheld or not upheld. If it is not upheld, we don't roll over as we hear from the interjections over there and I take offence on behalf of our legal team. We negotiate to make sure we get the best outcome when we're not going to have our decisions upheld. We don't win all of them, that is clear, but we always try and get the best outcome, as I just explained with the one in Tingalpa. With the case that uh, was mentioned by Councillor Cassidy at Power Street at Norman Park, two beautiful big Queenslanders on big blocks, <coughs> excuse me, illegally demolished in 2016 illegally demolished, approved by the now infamous certifier, Trevor Gearhart. We took him to court for wrongdoing and he was fined $30,000 and he had to pay our court costs. Right. Yeah. It then became a vacant lock of land with an application for townhouses. It was in low medium density, not low density residential, but we did not uphold a townhouse approval on this site, purely because we did not think it was fair that the residents were getting something totally out of what they expected because of one person or an owner of those houses demolishing them without approval. We absolutely outright refused 
that application. But that was not going to be upheld in court. It was a vacant block of land under low medium density and we needed to negotiate then on the best outcome, not a rollover. With the accusations that I am lying about comments when I say a development application is not supported in its current form. Listen to the words that I'm saying, Councillor Cassidy, through you, Mr Chair. Please cease interjecting. I was Councillor accused Adams. of lying very clearly by Councillor Cassidy when I said I didn't approve the application in its current form and then it got approved. Number one, I don't actually approve or not approve an application. That is done by the independent um, town planners in council. But I said I did not support it in its current form. Current form and final form are two very different things in development applications. And in the case of the one at Morningside, the house is being protected. It is being relocated and it will absolutely not be demolished. I stand by that we are here for the best outcomes of the community across any development application. We have set up the most transparent application process with Development Eye, where you can get a register now to get email notifications. You know exactly what's happening in this council, and I stand by the town planners in council and the legal team that support us through the courts. Further questions, Councillor Owen. Thank you. My question today is to the Chair of Public and Active Transport Committee, Councillor Murphy. Councillor Murphy, last week when we heard about the award-winning Brisbane Metro project, it's last week we heard about the award-winning Brisbane Metro project, and it's now my understanding that one of Council's key suppliers may have another award in their trophy cabinet. Can you please update the Chamber on this significant win for a local supplier? Councillor Murphy. Thank you very much for the question, Councillor Owen. And Mr Chair, as Councillor Owen noted in her question, we have uh, another award in the trophy cabinet. So Ozships Group have taken out two awards last week at the Australian Marine Industry Awards. They have won the Commercial Designer and Manufacturer of the Year for the second year in a row. And their first female apprentice, Jasmine, took out the Apprentice of the Year Award. And one of their other apprentices, Robbie, was also a finalist. So congratulations to Ozships, Jasmine and Robbie. And what a huge and well-deserved achievement in recognising the effort and hard work that everyone in the Ozships team puts in on a daily basis. As we all know, Ozships has had uh, their name dragged through the mud by someone who won't put their name to their claims, but someone who clearly has a chip on their shoulder. The spread of malicious rumours at the expense of hard-working small businesses like Ozships and award-winning apprentices like Jasmine and Robbie is extremely disappointing. I think we can all agree. Ozships has been a huge part of Council's ferry operations with the modifications of the new Kitty Cats, so these vessels were able to hit the water quickly and get people moving on our river again. Modifications that Ozships have made include ensuring that mooring arrangements matched our existing terminals and that passenger boarding ramp adjustments have been carried out. Safety features such as deck handrails and grab rails, as well as upgraded lighting, GPS tracking and radio communications were installed. Passenger seating layouts and priority seats were adjusted. Crew toilets were added for the convenience and safety of our masters and electronic TransLink ticketing and internal signage was added, as well as the iconic livery of our city ferry fleet in blue and gold, uh, and the occasional splash of red, but not too much, for our city hopper services. Our masters have been out training on the water all last week with the Kitty Cats, and they're very excited to be now back on the water delivering services for our city. Oz ships have been able to modify and get the Kitty Cats up to a standard that we require in Brisbane quickly and efficiently, which meant that the Lord Mayor and I were able to launch them on Sunday. Our ships have a great history of working with us to deliver modifications, changes and additions to our vessels with the launch of the revolutionary double-decker CityCat, CityCat 22 Yugara in November last year. Let's not forget that Yugara was the first double-decker CityCat and as the first of its type was a working prototype. 
like all first ships in class, the first double decker city cat has needed some modifications based on our experience in service. And as we have with the kitty cats, we work very closely with Oz ships to modify and amend any issues, big or small, to make sure our city cats of tomorrow are even better than the city cats of today. Some improvements that have been implemented on City Cat 23, Neville Bonner, as a result of learnings from the first generation four vessel, uh, include uh, things that we've done for, in both an operational and customer service perspective. They include improved drainage uh, and, and providing more efficient airflow and ventilation in the master's cabin. We've installed a fully curved deck to eliminate the angle deck at the boarding gates and small improvements to help ride performance, levelling of freeboard heights between the rear and forward gates and aluminium hull stiffeners to provide a smoother appearance of the hull. Operations and engineering feedback has helped progress the first of our new generation city cats, and it includes smaller modifications to increase access for maintenance, more powerful alternators to maintain battery charging, including carbon fibre alternator belts. I'm learning all about this new stuff, Chair. Safety has been improved through additional power surge protection, including uh, the addition uh, to our, of power protection to our CCTV system to prevent power spikes to the CCTV server. A continuous handrail was installed in the main cabin rather than intermittent grab rails, and the main cabin seat footings have been recessed to prevent trip hazards. It is usual to make modifications to vessels once they're in service in order to optimise performance, safety and customer amenity. For example, five Generation 1 vessels had their rear decks extended for additional customer space and seating and had an additional uh, front door installed to improve air ventilation and access to the passenger cabin. Modifications were made to the beams underneath one of the generation, uh, generation 1 vessels to eliminate wash on the back deck when reversing, just to name a few things. Chair, we're lucky to have award-winning companies like Ozships creating local jobs here in Brisbane, delivering generational improvements to our iconic city cat fleet, and we're proud to have uh, to be supporting a local Murray business. I have no doubt that companies like Ozships will be critical going forward as we develop the business case for the repair of our wooden hulled ferry fleet, so that residents can have com confidence that industry here in Brisbane has the skills, the experience, and the ability to de deliver major fleet projects to public transport providers like Brisbane City Council on a day-by-day -day basis. Councillor Murphy, your time has expired. Are there any further questions? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. My question is to the Deputy Mayor. Deputy Mayor, your administration has recently announced a decision to cease ferry services at the Thornton Street ferry terminal in Kangaroo Point. The primary justification for this is that a future footbridge will connect Kangaroo Point to the CBD, and a secondary justification is that the cost of upgrading the ferry terminal to disability compliance standards isn't justified. But as re many residents have pointed out, the ferry terminal doesn't just connect residents to the CBD. It was also used by the city hopper to connect to other parts of the city. And more to the point, not everyone will be able to use the new footbridge, which means this part of Kangaroo Point has seen a significant reduction in public transport services for local residents and people travelling into that part of Kangaroo Point. So my question to you is, what is your answer to residents who are concerned about the reduction in public transport services? And will your administration commit to improving public transport services for Kangaroo Point to compensate for the closure of Thornton Street Ferry Terminal? Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Shree, for the question. Look, accessibility and connectivity of our city is absolutely a key focus for this council. And we realise we've got 5.4 million people travelling by ferry every year. Uh, that river-based transport is a beloved part of our beautiful city, whether it be for the uh, lifestyle experience of travelling along the river and enjoying the views or actually getting quickly and safely to work um, as the best option to do that. But in June this year, this administration announced a $48.7 million over the next three years upgrade to terminals across the city. And they did focus on Mowbray Park, Dockside, South Bank 1 and 2. And, of course, the new state-of-the-art terminal at Howard Smith Wharves as well. Point of order, Chair, on relevance. The question was about Thornton Street Ferry Terminal. Um, yes, but also, wasn't it also about uh, access to the network for people who lived in that area? Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair, and that's exactly what I was talking about. Accessibility and connectivity right across 
uh, the community. We are very lucky that we have had a substantial financial commitment through the private sector to upgrade at Howard Smith Wharves, because we do see people flocking there as well. But that will also get us the extra connectivity through to the new Farm River Walk, Fortitude Valley and Kangaroo Point via the Story Bridge as well. We have upgraded the uh, New Farm Park and Guide Park Ferry Terminal, which is used by about a thousand people every point day. Point of order, Chair. A point of order, Councillor Shree. On relevance, the question was about Thornton Street Ferry Terminal and access for Kangaroo Point. It's nothing to do with Howard Smith Wharves or New Farm. Um, yeah, Councillor Adams, uh, I appreciate what you're doing, but can I please draw you, you back to the ferry uses around the New Farm, uh, not, excuse me, not New Farm, Kangaroo Point Peninsula in particular, please. Absolutely, Mr Chair, and I, I in interpreted the question to be about the connectivity around the whole precinct around the Story Bridge, but I, I'm more than happy to move on there. We have been upgrading infrastructure right across the city, but with regards to the Thornton Street Ferry Terminal, there are significant challenges to meet the accessibility standards, and also um, we have the issues there with the bridge as well. It is definitely going to be impacted at Thornton Street by the construction of the Kangaroo Point Green Bridge. And it will be one of the most used walking and cycling connections we realise in Brisbane. But the reality is it won't be usable once the, the bridge is built or during construction phase because of its proximity to that construction and the bridge as well. The other consideration is that the kitty cats, which were up on the river yesterday, I saw some beautiful photos, uh, cannot access that ferry terminal. So the city hopper that was there that has been replaced by the new and improved and um, kitty cats unfortunately cannot be used at that terminal and due to these circumstances we have to have taken the very difficult decision uh, to cease the services at Thornton Street permanently. It's not a decision that was taken lightly and I'm sure Councillor Murphy is working hard to see how that works through the peninsula with our cycleway links, with the bridge and how it connects. Point of order, Chair. Um, a point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Again, on, on relevance, this, this scripted answer is not an answering the question, which was whether new, new public transport services will be provided for the residents who've lost service at Thornton Street Ferry Terminal. I think you are getting the answer to the question that you want, it might, but it may not necessarily be the answer you want. But it is the question. Councillor Adams. I'll say it again because people are saying it's not about Kangaroo Point. The Thornton Street Terminal will be impacted by the construction of Kangaroo Point Bridge and obviously once it is constructed as well, it is not a viable terminal going forward and unfortunately the kitty cats don't actually uh, connect to Thornton Street Terminal and, and cannot be used. It was a tough decision. But in administration sometimes you need to make tough decisions and you need to prioritise. But in saying that, it does not mean that we are not priorities in Kangaroo Point and the connections they have to the CBD, whether that be water, road, cycle links or bridge. It is one of the most highly serviced areas for infrastructure in the city, perhaps other than the other area that is looked after by Councillor Shree, apparently, uh, in South Brisbane and Kirilpa with the services that they get over there as well. So we recognise that this will be a change for a lot of people that are used to the Thornton Street terminal, but there are the terminals in that peninsula that will still be, up, up, uh, will still be operating, including the upgrading of Dockside, which will be a new terminal as well for people of Kangaroo Point to, to uh, use as well. It's been temporarily not used at the moment. There are bus services, the 237, I'm not quite sure that's off the top of my head, that service exactly the same route. And there will, of course, be the fantastic new $190 million infrastructure investment for the Kangaroo Point Bridge. The people of Kangaroo Point will be able to use public and active transport to years to come. It might look different, and we'll work to make sure that they are serviced, as is every resident across the city. Further questions? Councillor Landers. My question is to the Chair of the Community, Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee, Councillor Howard. Councillor Howard, the Valley Fiesta is back for 2020 with COVID-19 guidelines in place. Can you please update the Chamber on some of the exciting acts in this year's festival and how residents can get involved? Councillor Howard. Well, thank you, Mr Chair, and through you, uh, thank you to Councillor Landers for the question. Um, Mr Chair, I think we all know that it's been difficult for all of us 
to have so many events and activities cancelled or postponed due to the pandemic. But no matter how tough or trying this year has been, the spirit of Brisbane continues unbroken. The way in which our community has united to get through the pandemic is nothing short of inspiring. And I've been particularly inspired by one of the hardest hit communities, our Brisbane musicians and our local businesses, particularly those in the Valley who were forced to put everything on hold for months when the coronavirus restrictions shut down the heart of Brisbane's nighttime economy. Seeing the, the Valley being able to reopen once restrictions eased was a relief, but it has been a long road to get where we are today. And whilst it is great to see more people out in the Valley supporting our local artists and businesses, we still have a long road to recovery ahead of us. So, as Brisbane's first ever nighttime economy chair, the first thing I did once being sworn in as chair was to hit the ground running by talking to our business owners in the valley and to listen to what we could do to support the heart of our nighttime economy. And that is how this year's Valley Fiesta was born. We knew we needed to shake things up and to do something really special to welcome everyone back to the Valley with a big bang. And so this Thursday, we are kicking off the biggest and best Valley Fiesta Brisbane has ever seen with a massive four-day lineup of live music. More than 90 local artists hitting Brisbane's 14 best live music venues in the Valley over four massive nights. It's great to see that Brisbane is just as excited as I am with some of the shows already sold out. We have dozens of hot new artists performing and also a few legends coming back to help us celebrate the Valley being back open for business. Kate miller Heike is just one of them and her sold out Friday night show at the Fortitude Music Hall was so popular that she's announced two more shows next week on Tuesday and Wednesday. So, if you haven't already jumped online to get a piece of the action, don't worry, it's not too late. You'll still have time to book your tickets now and to make sure that you don't miss out. We have so many exciting up-and-coming live acts in Brisbane taking the world by storm, and there's nothing more exciting than being able to experience an intimate live gig from an incredible artist before the rest of the world catches on to how great they are. So the only silver lining of the pandemic restrictions has probably been the fact that you've never had the opportunity to enjoy a live act like this before. Just imagine how incredible it would have been seeing a band like Powderfinger before they went big in an incredible place like the Trifford. And we've got other venues with even more intimate gigs. We are thrilled to have Ian Hogue, the guitarist from Powderfinger and The Church, as our Valley Fiesta 2020 ambassador. It really is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And with artists like Jaguar Jones, who've just taken out the National Live Music Award for Best Live Act in Queensland, you will not be disappointed. Unless, of course, you forget to grab yourself a ticket. So get online now and get your tickets before you miss out. Get your friends together and make this weekend one to remember. You can find out all about this weekend's epic lineup by heading to Q Music's website. There are also select few that are offering $10 tickets on the door and lots of free events to choose from too. I'd like to thank all of the people that helped put together this year's incredible Valley Fiesta and in particular to our business owners, the venues and the artists that have been doing it tough. Your, your unwillingness to let corona get the best of you is inspiring and I'm certainly looking forward to, to continuing our work together to support Brisbane's nighttime economy and ensure that we bounce back bigger and better than ever before. While we not, might not be able to have a dance at Valley Fiesta this week due to the restrictions, I can promise you that once Jeanette Young gives us the all clear, we'll be hitting the dance floor and we'll, when we're finally allowed to dance again. This administration is leading the nation with our commitment to creating more to see and do in Brisbane for Brisbane residents by supporting venues and artists to create a thriving nighttime economy. So I did a little check this morning for you and there are still tickets available um, for Thursday the 19th, um, Tired Lions New Album launch at the Tivoli, Patient Lounge with special guests Perth and Being Jane Lane at the Woolly Mammoth, Wax with special guests Blush and Psycho at the Zoo, Daniel J. Lewis will be tearing up some records at Susie Wong's Good Time Bar, and you can hit up at, the Rick's, at Rick's Backyard for free with Monsters Up North 
Rosemary Jasmary, DJ Howard, Joy, your time and has DJ. Expired. Oh, I had to get in DJ John further, Andrews. Further, further Can I just finish? Further questions. Oh, DJ Death Rays. Let me say that at the end. <laughs> very questions. important. Not, don't Cassidy. want to miss that. Don't want to miss that. That just rolls right off the tongue. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, my question is to the Acting Mayor. Uh, Labor has been very careful not to use the forbidden L word in the chamber today in previous questions, but we have very clearly pointed out that Team Schrinner has an awful track record of being deceitful, dishonest and spreading disinformation to Brisbane residents. If a community is outraged by development, the LNP will reject the DA, but then do a deal behind closed doors only to blame it on the courts. This is very concerning considering current DAs before the Planning Environment Court take 415 to 427 Beckett Road, Bridgman Downs, for example. It's known critical koala habitat that a developer wants to build shops and a fuel station on. It's now off to the Planning and Environment Court and to use Councillor Adams' own words, you win some and you lose some. Well, Councillor Adams, given your team is notorious for telling furfies, how on earth can any resident trust that you won't do another secret deal with this developer in Bridgman Downs? Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. And um, beyond the imputing motive of secret deals, beyond the mistruths of furfies, I would like to stand here and say that I have never lied to this chamber. I have never lied to the people of Brisbane. I have never lied to development uh, applications, uh, uh, people that have applied for applications, or to the community about the expectations that are upheld by the Brisbane City Council and the Team Schrinner. Again, I outrightly refute the fact that we are using the courts Councillors, please allow the answer to be heard. And the comments, you win some and lose some, I'm already being verbaled, as I should have known. Yeah. I said, when you go to court, you win some and you lose some. And C our councillors, record... Councillors, no. Please allow the answer to be heard. Councillor Adams. And our record is strong. We want to make it very clear to the building and construction industry in Brisbane... Councillors, please allow... Uh, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, please cease interjecting or I'll move into the formal process. Councillor Adams. We want to make it very clear what we expect in Brisbane. We expect good design, good practice, clean, green, sustainable buildings, fitting in with the city plan or performance outcomes that are great for the community. And if you do not uphold that, we will refuse your application. And if we go to p and &E Court and that is not upheld, we will fight for the community to get the best negotiated outcome that we can get. They keep screaming out, you don't. I don't see them sitting there day in and day out with our legal team in p and &E Court. But whether it's upheld or not, it's about getting the best outcome for the community. To say that we tell lies is in itself a mistruth, and I outrightly reject any of those comments from Councillor Cassidy's question today. That concludes question point time. Of order, point, point of order, order Chair. Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, thanks very much. I uh, move suspension standing orders to enable me to move the following urgency motion. That Brisbane City Council buys the land at 415 to 427 Beckett Road, Bridgman Downs. That's just been sent through. Do you have a seconder? Second. Councillor Griffiths. So I've got a uh, That's been emailed. urgency resolution proposed by uh, Councillor Cassidy, second by Councillor Griffiths. It will be distributed in a moment. Yeah, I believe that I can see that. Uh, Councillor Cassidy, your timer will be reset and you'll have three minutes to uh, urgency, point of order, please. Chair. Point of oh, order to you, uh, Councillor Murphy. Here we go. Um, just on the competency of this motion, I mean, this it's a, this, several I'm times this session, no, 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 there was no debate about... There was Goodness. no debate about point of order. Yes, Councillor Murphy, please. Just, just a genuine up, question Ryan. on the competency of this motion, up. given we've, on, we've debated this several keep times up. already. Councillor Cassidy, Councillor Cassidy, I consider you are displaying unsuitable meeting conduct and in accordance with section 21.5 of the Meetings Local just Law 2001, I time, hereby request they? that you cease interjecting and refrain from exhibiting that conduct. Councillor Murphy, you had a point of order. Uh, Chair, it was just a simple question to you on the competence of this motion, given we've had this urgency motion, I think, four times now. So, whether, uh, as I've whether... said in the past, the, the question of competence will be raised if urgency is accepted. At this point, the matter of urgency is what is being, is what will be resolved, and not the competency of the nature of the or the substance of the resolution. Councillor Cassidy, three minutes, please. 
Well, thanks, thanks very much, Chair. We have had um, a motion to suspend standing orders to establish the urgency and the need to purchase this land many times. That's right, Councillor Murphy, through you, uh, Mr Chair. Well, if, you, if you on that side of the chamber, and particularly Councillor Davis, had the guts to debate this, uh, this, this motion, uh, we would establish that it's urgent and we do it right now. I don't know why this administration runs and hides when it comes to this topic. We're happy, we're happy to have this debate and to put the community's case on the table that this is urgent. And it is particularly urgent now, Chair, because what we've heard here today from the Acting Mayor and the, the Chair of the City Planning Committee just today in the last hour uh, is confirmation that while they will say one thing to the community, and we have heard this over and over again in the McDowell community, uh, that uh, Councillor uh, says, Councillor Cassidy, I don't like Councillor this Cassidy, development. Can, can you please uh, come back to urgency, please, rather than, than substance? So it's matter, urgent, Chair, urgency. because urgency. we know the playbook. We now know the playbook. It's there writ large for everyone to see. This administration will say one thing in the community and then they'll do something different in the Planning and Environment Court. It's urgent because this matter is now before the Planning and Environment Court. We've got a local council running around out there saying, no, I don't like the development, don't like the development. We know then, we know then what happens behind closed doors. There's a negotiated outcome. Council rolls over and they say, they say to the developer, sure, go ahead. And we know that the- Point of order, point, Mr point Chair. Of order, point of order. Claim to be misrepresented. Uh, I, don't think the, been, I don't think the acting mayor has spoken noted. on this motion. Um, um, Just follow there, there the is rules, some pejorative, uh, Hang on, I'm speaking. There is some pejorative framing of this uh, subject. Uh, however, this is a debating chamber. Um, a councillor can claim misrepresentation uh, in this instance, Councillor Cassidy. Thanks, Chair. So what the Lord Mayor has said in this place in the last few weeks is that uh, this bushland apparently can be saved through a negotiated outcome. Well, we know now what the evidence is here that negotiated outcomes means that these DAs are approved, but they're approved behind closed doors. And that's why we need to have this land purchased. That's why it's urgent, Chair. Uh, this is known koala habitat. There are gliders, there are birds, there are macropods here. And we know that this land won't be protected through a negotiated outcome in the Planning and Environment Court. So I think it's high time that the Lord Mayor, that the Acting Mayor, that LNP councillors, particularly Councillor Davis, gets on record and says something about this development in this chamber and puts up or shuts up once and for all. I will now, we will now vote to the matter of urgency. Oh, excuse me, the uh, misrepresentation, please. Councillor uh, Cassidy said that, I said when I stood up, that it's clear now that when we go into court, we do shady deals behind closed doors. I did absolutely not say that. All right, okay, we're having a vote. All right, all those in favour of, uh, of urgency, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cumming. Please ring the bells. All councillors are present. All those in favour of the matter of urgency, please say aye and raise your hand and hold it there so it may be counted. Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand and hold it there. No. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it. The voting being six in favour and 19 against. The noes have it. Councillors, I will now... Uh, um, Mr Chair, sorry, point of order. Point of order, Councillor Cumming. I'd like to move a uh, move the standard orders to be suspended to allow me to move an urgency resolution that Brisbane City Council stop the destruction of trees on the Anglicare property at Oceana Terrace, Lota. Seconded. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, it has have, been sent through. Thank you, uh, Councillor Cumming. Uh, I have an urgency resolution moved by Councillor Cumming, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. I believe it's being distributed at the moment. Uh, Councillor Cumming, your clock will be reset in a moment and you'll have three minutes. Please proceed. Thank uh, please, you. Thank excuse you, me, Councillor Cumming. Uh, please uh, focus your comments on urgency. Yes, thanks, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, uh, Oceana Terrace Loader contains an Anglicare property on which the Council has approved a multi-storey retirement village in the middle of the lower density residential area. But worse still, dozens of magnificent old trees, mainly gums, are to be removed by the rapacious developer. And uh, 
recently local residents were photographed in the Courier Mail protesting about this uh, decision. Uh, time is running out for Council to stop this destruction of lovely old trees as work is due to start early in 2021. Uh, council has recently been found out reducing the uh, canopy cover of trees in Brisbane by 1.4 per cent over the last four years. The later house development will make the situation even worse. This will add to this disastrous trend which will make Brisbane hotter with less shade and poor air quality. It's urgent that Council act now. On the matter of urgency, um, all those who believe this matter to be urgent, please say aye and uh, aye, just say aye. Those against, please say no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cumming, please ring the bells. All councillors are present. All those uh, who believe this matter to be urgent, please say aye and raise your hand. Thank you. And all those against, please say no and raise your hands. No. Clarks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the noes have it. The voting being six in favour and 19 against. The noes have it. Councillors, we will now move to the consideration of committee reports, please. The Establishment Coordination Committee report, please. The Acting Lord Mayor. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday the 9th of November 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been uh, moved by the Acting Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Land as the Establishment Coordination Committee meeting, the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting dated Monday the 9th of November 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. And uh, before I get to the substantive uh, report before us today, I'd just like to raise two things about the uh, urgency motions that we just heard before us. Uh, again, Councillor Murphy did indicate, as he was right in saying, even maybe not in the right time, that we have heard this time and time again for Beckett Road. Um, but time and time again, we have explained to Councillor Cassidy that Minister Dick had every opportunity to call in this development, but he didn't. Councillors, please allow uh, the Acting Lord Mayor to be heard in silence. The site has 50 per cent of matters of state environmental significance on it, which is why we said no to the application and why we will stand firm on that in planning an environment court. But, of course, the state government said we don't care. Council can deal with it. So that is the truth of the matter when it comes to Beckett Road in this place. With the trees at the Anglicare site, I am more concerned that Councillor Cumming wants a political stunt about the mistruths and tree covers in this city than ringing straight through to compliance office and check that there is not a legal removal of trees on that site. There was an outrage, I know, in Tilly Road, Councillor Murphy, when some trees went down that unfortunately were not protected by the koala state mapping. But we got out there straight away and stopped work until we made sure that those trees did or did not have protection on them. But what does Councillor Cumming do? He may have called cars, I'm not quite sure. He may have called cars, but it was more important that he got up here and moved an urgency motion than worried about the real matters of protecting the trees. Councillors, please allow the, yeah, please allow Councillor Adams to be heard. Councillor Adams. There is a DA on the site, and if the trees have been approved to be removed, then they're allowed to be removed. But if Councillor Cumming clearly said in that motion, illegally moved, then he should be calling it in. Calling it into the call centre to the cast team and saying, I don't believe they're the trees that are allowed to be removed. Please stop work now. But what happens out in the community, to borrow one of their words, and what is said in here are two very different things as well. Obviously, for all the people watching at home, including the Lord Mayor, who I know is healthy and well in isolation, um, the Lord Mayor is healthy and well in isolation and has come back with a negative response to his COVID test, but under the Chief Health Organ um, uh, Officer's advice, will be isolating for another five to 14 days uh, to ensure that no signs or symptoms show um, from his trip to Adelaide with the Adelaide uh, Lord Mayor. 
Uh, during the week, we had a few things, and I'd <coughs> love to have the ability now to uh, talk about the lighting of our council assets that we have coming up during this week. It's uh, World Prematurity Day, celebrating to raise awareness of the 15 million babies born premature worldwide, and nearly one million of those, unfortunately, who lose their lives. So that is today, and we will see the Sandgate Town Hall story and Victoria Bridges and City Hall in purple tonight for those. We also have National Bully Prevention Week this week, with Sandgate Town Hall and Brisbane City Hall will be orange on Wednesday to show the support. Hopefully we'll ski squeeze in a little bit of uh, maroon after our win tomorrow night at Suncorp Stadium, and uh, that will be on, of course, after the decider on Story in Victoria Bridges, Tropical Dome at Mount Cutha and Radcliffe Place sculptures as well. There are many items before us today which I will get straight into. Item A is the Monia Road Bellwood Street upgrade, which is a partial property resumption. Um, it's a road that connects an industrial state in Dara and therefore carries a high percentage of heavy vehicles. At the moment, there is poor visibility at the intersection and drivers are struggling to make safe turns through the intersection. So, with those, going, uh, those heavy vehicles travelling through, there are quite severe crashes that hop, happen there often, and the idea is to get the resumption to improve the safety, installing traffic lights with a right turn signal at the intersection to ensure vehicles have safe opportunities to make turns. There will also be bicycle lanes constructed on Monia Road in both directions and pedestrian crossing facilities provided. In preparation for the upgrade, there's one partial resumption required to make way for the new and improved intersection and a small corner of an industrial property on the northern side required to make way for the left turn from Monia Road into Bellwood Street. And we can look forward to that progressing next year to make sure that all of our road users bike cars and pedestrians can get through there safely. Item B is our contracts and tendering, which again is a very long list, and I'll leave that to the chambers and the chairs of the particular portfolios. Item C is the Infrastructure Design Consultancy Services. Um, obviously, this service panel plays a very key role in the development of a wide range of infrastructure projects that we undertake across the city. The panel has been in place since mid-2015 and currently comprises 71 suppliers who provide uh, consultancy services that help inform some of our built and our non-built uh, infrastructure works. This item before us today seeks to update and refresh the panel. We are focusing on smaller, more bespoke consultancy companies who can offer more specialised services. So the panel will actually slightly reduce in size to ensure that the vendors get enough opportunity to quote and provide their service to council, because we often hear from vendors that are on panels that they get onto a panel, then they're never actually used um, for their service as well. The ultimate goal is to engage a, a wider range of niche consultants that can provide expertise about particular complex and specialised aspects of infrastructure projects. On top of that, we are seeking to lend a hand to the local businesses in any way we can, and Refresh This Consultancy Panel is a great way that we can support our local businesses. Item D is the Stores Board for the Design and Construction to Baranda and Griffith Uni Busway Stations. Uh, Council is investing in building a greater transport network, obviously, with the $1.244 billion delivery of Brisbane Metro. And we have to thank again the Australian Government for their $300 million funding for this project. The upgrade of these two bus stations are conditions imposed on Council by Transport and Main Roads in granting their approvals for Council to undertake works on the busway as a part of the Brisbane Metro project. TMR requires that Council provide full details of the scope of these upgrades, including its procurement by the 31st of January next year, and any procurement strategy there other than delivery by the Collaborative Partnership must be approved by TMR. We're moving forward with Metro which is very exciting. It's about getting people home quicker and safer by providing frequent, convenient and reliable services. And this is the next step in generating those 2,600 jobs through the design and construct of this infrastructure. Still on the Metro, uh, item E is the rejection of compensation claims for 59 School Road at Rochdale. Uh, it is the uh, 
reject, as I said, for compensation, and we are seeking approval to pay an advance compensation arising from the resumption of the property at 59 School Road. Council has engaged independent valuers. Horrigan commits this valuers to the as assess the value of the land. HKV will then assess the compensation on a preliminary basis for the land component and the exclusive, of course, disturbance at this stage. Unfortunately, the former owner hasn't provided enough evidence to allow Council to fully assess all elements of the claims. Therefore, we've recommended a lesser amount of compensation to the landowner based on the independent values land assessment and evidence provided by the former landowner at this site. Item F, Mr Chair, before us is the Dockside Ferry Terminal upgrade that I touched on briefly before. Uh, and as I said, we know there's 5.4 million people on our ferries every year. River-based transport is much beloved in Brisbane and also accessibility and connectivity is a big focus of this administration. So in the budget this year, Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner announced $48.7 million for upgrades of terminals over the next three years. And that way we can actually roll out the upgrades that meet the DDA compliance as required um, by 2022. They include Dockside, Mowbray, Street, uh, Mowbray Park, South Bank and the new state-of-the-art terminal at Howard Smith Wharves. So Councillor Murphy shared with us last week and how the Mowbray uh, Park terminal has now been lodged. Um, the submission today will facilitate the important works that we see at Dockside Terminal. It was actually constructed 30 years ago, which seems like a blink of an eye for me, but some people mightn't have been alive at that time in these chambers. Uh, but accessibility standards have changed a great deal since then. So with this submission, we're seeking to apply to the Department of Natural Resources resources and mines to resume the land needed to get started with this project. Currently the uh, functionality is in a very poor condition, there's a limited lifespan and it's not compliant with current accessibility standards. So we're looking forward to unlocking the potential of Kangaroo Point residents to reach more destinations through this upgrade as well. Councillor Adams, your time has expired. Moved for extension. Seconded. Extension of time has been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Hutton. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. Councillor Adams, you have further 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, item G before us today is the Newnham Road and Wecker Road intersection upgrade. Uh, an intersection upgrade close to my heart, I know, and Councillor Murphy, an exciting road project that Council will be delivering with the Federal Government under the Better Roads for Brisbane program. A very busy intersection, a very complex intersection uh, with five roads coming in to the intersection, major roads, carrying 35,000 vehicles each day. It has got a high crash uh, history, particularly at the Wecker and Newnham Road part of this intersection. And so it's been identified to make that intersection safer. We need new uh, turning lanes and fully controlled turning manoeuvres. The only way we can do this, obviously, is to resume the properties uh, and the, the front of three properties on Newnham Road. The bonus of this is the connectivity for pedestrians and cyclists that's going to be delivered with new signalised pedestrian crossings. Of course, there's also a uh, school at this intersection as well, so we'll see enhanced footpaths, shared paths and pedestrian crossings. There'll be additional turning lanes which will stop motorists ta from taking dangerous turns into Wecker Road and having a, a bit of a gambit if they're going to make it around, and some small partial resumptions as well. The item relates to five partial resumptions within the project vicinity, as well as the subdivision of a small part of Graham Lord Park, which will be, uh, the corner of the park will be needed to be dedicated as road. So City Projects Office is getting close to finalising the design. We expect to see shovels in the ground mid next year, but we look forward to the improved safety for all road users here as well. Item H before us today is the go-between tolling relief scheme. Uh, a key part of our transport network, obviously, with the Brisbane Metro. High frequency, high capacity, dedicated busways and linking with suburban bus and train services. And we know that there's going to be a number of road closures required to facilitate this project. And there will be a fair bit of disruption, I imagine, with residents living through South Brisbane, Highgate Hill and West End. So in particular, delivering the metro uh, in the inner city area, including the CBD and South Brisbane. We've engaged with the Queensland Government on a range of departments to progress the project. And we've come up with a state project deed and construction interface deed with the lead DTMR, including the revision 
of tolling relief for the go-between bridge for local residents in the area during the construction of the project. So it is proposed in the item before us today that private households in the 4101 postcode are provided with toll credit for the use of the go-between bridge to assist in mitigating the impact of this construction work. Transurban and Council agree with the proposal and I commend this submission to the Chamber. And last but surely not least, what we have today is item A, the proposed advertisements interim local law that I have spoken about in this place, along with Councillor Marks, uh, earlier in this session uh, when it was first uh, spoken about. This is the first step through the process with the state government. We undertook a review of the assessment process. Uh, the announcement was a response to reasonable concerns in the communities that the criteria for billboard applications was failing to meet community expectations. So being a responsive council and listening to the community, we are looking at this interim local law to ensure billboards are not approved in inappropriate locations in the city. Uh, before Council can give full effect to this interim local law, a state interest check will need to be completed. Um, the interim local law only has an effective period of six months which, by which we will progress the substantive amendments to local laws to introduce the criteria protections in this. If during this period, um, during the consultation period, we identify further changes, we will of course implement them as they come through as well. But they're there for discussion with the Chamber today and I uh, support all of these items to the Chamber. Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Just uh, at the outset, I ask item uh, clause B be taken seriously for voting, please. Clause B uh, yes. for voting. Thanks very much. Uh, just rolling through these alphabetically, Chair. Uh, clause A, Monty Road and Bellwood Street intersection upgrade, uh, the resumption of 123 square metres of land at uh, 108 Bellwood Street, Darra, for that intersection upgrade we've heard about, um, sitting right on the corner of the intersection, uh, and it is required. Um, to make room for the upgrade according to the report before us. There are no objections received after Council issued those notices of intention to resume in June, so we'll be supporting uh, that item. Clause B, contracts uh, and tendering. Here we have a list of contracts that delegates have entered into on behalf of Council. Now, a number of them have caught uh, our attention, Chair, and raised some questions. Under Transport for Brisbane, we have a contract extension for disinfecting and sanitising Brisbane's bus fleet. This is something that we um, have spoken about in this chamber before. Um, it um, was awarded and the extension is to a social enterprise. While this is certainly good and we support social enterprises, this is an example of work that can and should be done in-house because the people who are currently employed through that social enterprise uh, chair would certainly benefit more if they were given a permanent job in council, for example. Uh, sanitise, sanitisation of council's buses is an ongoing and daily job. It certainly won't uh, be ceasing any time soon. Uh, so we shouldn't be contracting this work out. We should be seeking to in-house these sort of services. Uh, in-house jobs are solid, reliable and give employees uh, more uh, security. Um, they provide a greater opportunity for promotion and career progression as well within council. Uh, the seventh contract uh, in this document is um, for $1.8 million worth of contract extensions for external legal services. Uh, we saw just in the last couple of weeks a submission, a submission come to Council with the purpose of engaging smaller, apparently, smaller local firms to help with some of Council's legal work, despite there being dozens and dozens and dozens of lawyers employed in city legal service. Uh, so the idea then was to um, support those smaller firms, yet in this contract we see that some of the biggest firms in the country are listed uh, in getting this $1.8 million worth of work. So I suppose the question is what happened to supporting these small and local businesses? Many smaller firms have gone broke, many have been forced to shut down due to COVID-19 and here we see council forking out millions of dollars to firms which dominate the market uh, and certainly don't help smaller firms. Uh, on clause C, 
uh, the Stores Board submission the significant contracting plan for infrastructure design consultancy services. And this is certainly a common theme uh, for this administration at the moment. Uh, the recommendation is to establish the CPA for infrastructure design consultancy services. A whopping $180 million is expected to be spent over the next five years. The plan before us today shows how hollow Council's ability to do early works and design in-house really has become under the LMP. If we had a more robust in-house team to do some of this work, even, even a small amount of this work, we wouldn't have to spend the hundreds of millions of dollars on um, consultancies here. It would also reduce risks significantly. We see in this clause that there is a significant risk um, of non-compliance with standards. Uh, if more of this early project work was done in-house instead of contracting it out constantly, it would reduce that risk because council standards would be met each and every time. It would also reduce the ridiculously large contingencies we're seeing pop up more and more often, the KSD effect, a risk of bumping into unknown underground services and blowing out costs, all because Council has no capability um, of doing any of those early works before those contracts are issued. The risk would be lower if design and early works were done in-house by council employees instead of passing the buck to external contractors. And a perfect example of huge contingencies, Chair, happens to be the next clause, Clause D, the Stores Board submission for design and construction of upgrades to Buranda and Griffith University busway stations. And that's something that the Deputy Mayor, or the Acting Mayor, um, did not touch on uh, when she spoke about this contract. We have the submission for the design and construction of the two busway um, station extensions for um, the Brisbane Banana Bus Project. It lists here that these two stations are expected to cost $47 million. What has not been made publicly available for uh, anyone other than the councillors in this room is the mega contingency that goes along with that funding. That is the worst case scenario backup fund, Chair. So the big contingencies are the new norm when it comes to contracts that the LNP are issuing. Recently, every time a project has come to this chamber, the percentage of contingencies seems to be larger than the last one. The LNP administration is clearly once bitten twice shy uh, after the KSD cost blowout and don't even trust themselves to get a project done without major hiccups. Perhaps, Chair, if we had in-house capabilities and resources to do early works uh, that, and those abilities weren't so shallow and hollow, we could lower these contingencies and lower the risks that uh, these projects would be blowing out. The Brisbane Metro project has been uh, flawed from the start because uh, this Lord Mayor in this place went out to tender on parts of it before even getting approvals in place. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about chook raffles in this chamber over the last few weeks. Uh, Chair, I would hate to see a chook raffle organised by Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner or the LMP. He would sell raffle tickets, call out the winning number, but not have any chook to give to them, Chair. The Lord Mayor does things back to front and is costing ratepayers millions and millions of dollars. Uh, this um, item before us today also says there's a significant risk of a change in scope required to accommodate busway owner requirements. Again, we are doing things back to front instead of, instead of um, going forward with um, the plans and the early works done and then going to the busway um, owner, um, the state government, and saying this is what we're going to do. We're doing it all back to front. Uh, no wonder the contingency on this project is absolutely astronomical. There's also a significant risk of, you guessed it, unknown services such as mechanical and electrical communications, just like there was on the KSD project and so many others, and lo and behold, that contingency was eaten up because Council had no ability to do those early works. So if we had that solid in-house team chair to go out and survey these project sites and do the early works, these risks would be lower, and therefore the contingency and cost blowouts would be lower as well. On Clause E, Chair, Brisbane Metro project, the rejection of claim for compensation uh, of that land at 59 School Road, Rochdale, we heard the Acting Mayor uh, talk about. I've been out there and um, seen that land, um, uh, and I think what is before us is actually a reasonable outcome in that case. Clause F, the dockside uh, ferry terminal. Uh, the upgrade of that ferry terminal. It says in the clause, and we've heard from Councillor Adams, the terminal is 30 years old now. 
uh, it's currently in poor condition, is not compliant with accessibility standards. So that's, that's clear in black and white, Chair, that this administration has neglect, neglected ferry terminals, not just here, but right across the city. Year on year, ferry maintenance budgets have been underspent. Uh, because of this negligence, we've seen the LNP cut ferry services, and it is now residents who are suffering because of it. We know the terminal uh, at Norman Park uh, has to be shut down for good now. Uh, and if this Lord Mayor is willing to upgrade the Dockside Ferry Terminal, uh, why not uh, the Norman Park Ferry Terminal as well, Chair? This administration is clearly favouring some residents over others. What makes the Dockside Ferry communities more of a priority than Norman Park Ferry communities? Both have work to get to in the morning. Services should only be cut as a last resort. They should, these um, terminals should be upgraded and promoted if commuter numbers are down because of their inaccessibility. Plus, if the Lord Mayor uh, plans to fix this, the um, wooden monohull ferries like he keeps claiming, then we will have plenty of boats to service all of these routes. But again, I doubt uh, the Lord Mayor's intentions are that at all. We now see the kitty cats are on the water and we still don't even have a quote for the repair of the wooden monohull ferries and it's been months and months since they were taken out of service. If the Lord Mayor planned to get rid of the monohulls all along, why doesn't he just come clean chair and say it? If an upgrade is good enough for Dockside, then it is certainly good enough for all ferry terminals that have been neglected by this LNP administration. On Clause G, um, Newnham Road and Wecker Road intersection upgrade, another land resumption this time um, at those roads, Malkavat East. Uh, the land total here is 189 square metres from five separate properties. Uh, and again, we see in the papers, Council has not received any objections uh, to those resumption notices. Uh, the report also notes that a 182 square metre slice of the Graham Lord Park will be used to create a new shared path to replace the narrow footpath that needs at the intersection, this is something uh, we will um, support. Clause H, the go between uh, bridge toll relief scheme. So this is to provide uh, toll relief on the go between bridge for people living Councillor in the- Councillor Cassidy, your time has expired. Hope. Yeah. Seconded. Move, an extension of time should be moved by Councillor Cummings, seconded by Councillor Griffiths. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. Councillor Cassidy, 10 minutes. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, for uh, residents, I said, living in the 4101 postcode. Now, just a couple of months ago, it was announced it was announced that tolls would be scrapped on the go-between bridge for South Brisbane residents, while the Victoria Bridge was out of action due to Brisbane Metro Works. Um, this was at the insistence, of course, of the Queensland government that this occurs as those uh, conditions. Uh, in the letter dated the 10th of September from the Department of Transport and Main Roads uh, Minister uh, Mark Bailey, one of the conditions for the Brisbane Metro project to go ahead was the provision of toll relief for South Brisbane residents impacted by the closure of, of Victoria Bridge to private vehicles during the construction of the project. So this toll relief for South Brisbane residents is before us today thanks to the state government requirements. While the state government didn't specify the exact details of toll relief, what is proposed is a payment of a $100 or $100 credit um, to toll accounts for residents of the 4101 postcode per year. So at 2020 toll prices of $3.29 for cars and $1.65 for motorbikes, that is around 30 trips a year for cars and around 60 trips a year for motorbikes across the go-between bridge. So 30 trips a year for cars and 60 a year for motorbikes. That is hardly um, the scrapping of tolls on the go-between bridge for these residents. Clause I, finally, the advertisement's local law. Um, so, as we discussed when uh, this was last in the Chamber a few weeks ago, this uh, definitely is the Save Councillor Maddox skin amendment uh, and nothing more here. For years, this administration chair um, has let big, disruptive uh, eyesore billboards pop up across town, ruining Brisbane's character and privatising our suburbs. But it's only when an LNP councillor, and only then, comes under fire that something is done about them. Uh, this was happening on their watch for a very long time, and it's only when residents uh, got up in arms that they decided they needed to do something about it. This local law proposal is the bare minimum response. There are plenty of other places around the city where billboards are an issue. 
but they're not near a uh, heritage or a character uh, commercial building. So more needs to be done to protect the character of Brisbane suburbs uh, more broadly. The response uh, here, um, this temporary um, advertisement's local law, uh, is straight out of the LNP's playbook chair. It only acts if it saves face in a marginal LNP ward. Further speakers, Councillor Hutton. Chair, I rise to speak in support of item A, the Monia Road and Bellwood Street intersection land resumption. Personally, I'm very excited about this infrastructure project and I know my community is too. It was only four months ago that I was driving along Monia Road towards Bellwood Street to find a serious accident had happened just moments earlier. A small car had been T-boned at, at this intersection and as a result was thrown across the road reserve, slamming into the trees. The poor lady was trapped in her car, distressed and in pain, while the other driver, although safe, was clearly shaken by the whole experience. Fortunately, everyone was okay and the emergency services did an exceptional job of responding so quickly to my call. This is just one of many accidents that have occurred at this intersection, hence why I'm very happy to see the partial resumption of land brought to this chamber today. Obviously, this is in preparation for the intersection upgrade, which will improve the safety for the 11,500 vehicles that travel along this road daily. This upgrade will provide more than just safety for our drivers, but bicycle lanes in both directions, improved pedestrian facilities and lighting. I know these improvements will make a huge difference, and I'm grateful that our administration is focused on getting residents home sooner and safer. Further speakers, Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. I rise to speak on, I'll say, all of the items. I'm not sure how far I'm going to get, um, but I would ask that items C, D and E be taken seriatim for voting purposes, and H. Um, for clarification, C, D and E together? Yes. And then H separately? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Please, please proceed. Um, Thank you, Mr Chairman. Briefly on item A, I'm very happy um, that Councillor Hutton is um, receiving a road safety upgrade in uh, Dara, Monia Road. Um, it's concerning to hear, though, that there are only 11,500 vehicles a day passing through this intersection. Um, 65,000 vehicles a day pass through the intersection of Venner Road and Ipswich Road, and yet this council refuses to act. Uh, there are accidents there on a regular basis. So whilst I'm pleased to see the investment um, in Dara, um, that same level of investment needs to be made in Annerley as well. With respect to item B, just briefly, like Councillor Cassidy, I read with interest, with interest, because, you know, I had thought I did make a little um, mistake uh, when I spoke about this matter when it came to Council a few weeks ago. Clearly, I just had my crystal ball out. Uh, when I said that Council was going to appoint um, these big companies, Clayton Newts, Minter Ellison, McCulloch Robertson, Chambers Westgas, Cause Biggers and Paisley. Um, and I was ridiculed by, I think it was Councillor Adams and Councillor Murphy, I uh, can't remember who else. Guess what? That's exactly what you went and did. You appointed some of the biggest Australian and multinational law firms to represent councils, despite the Lord Mayor standing up in this place and claiming this was all about giving the little guy a go. Well, clearly that was not the case. Now, we know they've been rolled over for six months. Who knows what's going to happen in six months' time? But let me say, guess what? You guys did exactly the opposite of what you said you were going to do. Exactly the opposite of what you said you were going to do. Um, so where's your standing up for the little guy and rolling over the contracts with the big guys? Because uh, clearly you are not doing what you yeah, say. Councillor Johnson, can I just ask you to direct comments through the chair, please? Uh, yes, with respect to item uh, C. I do not support item C in its current form, and the reason I don't support it is because there is not enough information in this report before us uh, today. Firstly, um, there are a number of issues of great concern in the report. Um, at paragraph 28, Council states that the purpose of this significant contracting plan is to limit the number of suppliers in each category and segment, uh, but it does not say what that limit will be. 
Is it one? Is it two? Is it six? Is it ten? There is absolutely no information here, um, and it is extremely concerning that Council's stated purpose in the significant contracting plan is to reduce the number of suppliers in each category. Equally, there is very limited information about how many suppliers there are in the existing 24 categories. Currently, it says there are 71 suppliers across 24 categories. That's not very many. That's less than three per category. Um, so I don't know what's going on here, and it's because this report does not provide a full and complete um, assessment for me as a councillor to understand uh, and vote on. And I just say this very strongly. If you are limiting the number of suppliers in each category, you need to be clear about to what number, why and how many per segment. That information is not included in this report. Um, you're increasing the number of categories. It doesn't say what they are going to be. That information is not included in this report. Um, and it is adding a mechanism to add or remove suppliers through the life of the panel. Who's going to do that? Some junior council officer sitting up there in Brisbane Square? How are they going to do it? What are the criteria? Is any of that in the report? No, it is not. This document is dangerously inadequate. It will not lead to a fair or reasonable process, and that's its stated objectives. But then it gets worse. It then goes on to talk about how um, let me just turn over to the paragraph that I'm on. Uh, evaluation methodology, paragraph 49. It talks about how submissions will be assessed against the weighted evaluation criteria. They're all fairly standard things that Council looks at. It goes on to say that at any time submissions will be excluded from other evaluation or shortlisting, uh, shortlisting where there are certain things that are not met. Then the paragraph goes on to say, however, any submission may be included on any shortlist where the evaluation team considers, despite the score achieved, there are strong documented commercial reasons for further consideration of the submission. So on one hand, Council is saying all submissions will be evaluated against these criteria, local benefits, company track record, capacity of personnel and company capacity, commercial standards. Uh, management systems and social responsibility. Now, if a company does not meet the criteria, Council's giving itself a clause to say, well, it doesn't matter if they don't meet the criteria. If we think that they are OK, we're just going to put them on the list. That is what this report says at paragraph 49. That is wrong. Wrong. If you are having an objective and fair process where suppliers are being evaluated against one another, against an objective set of criteria, one of which is their commercial acumen and their, another is their capacity to deliver, and they do not meet the minimum scores required, it is unreasonable then to say, well, I think they're all right, we'll just put them on the list anyway. And that is what Council is asking us to do here. Now, this is hundreds of millions of dollars when it comes to everyday business with Council, and it is unreasonable that Council is making these changes, uh, and it is not transparent, it is not accountable, and in my view, it is inadequate. Very briefly on item D, the busways. Here's another one. Council says that it will support the little guys. Council says it will support local suppliers. Well, Axie owners getting another sweetheart deal here from Council um, with a, with a um, major uh, bus, uh, busway works for two new bus stops. Surely this would be an opportunity to put it to the market, um, to allow a local supplier to work with a major uh, multinational corporation in a collaborative way to build their experience, to provide a little bit of independence and truth testing in how Axiona operates. But no, we're just going to do a sweetheart deal um, with a Spanish company. And, you know, uh, the Lord Mayor, when he stands up and says, oh, we support the locals, well, clearly that's not the case. Um, and I'm really disappointed that Council, when these smaller uh, components are coming up, that they're not going to consider um, an alternative arrangement. I think that's really disappointing. 
Uh, just briefly, with respect to uh, the tolls, um, I don't support uh, this arrangement. Um, certainly, it seems unreasonable to me. I couldn't find the cost in here anywhere, so I don't know where you got it from, Councillor Cassidy, in the report. Yeah? Yeah, oh, $100, I see. Yes, it is. Uh, apologies, it is there. Um, but uh, 4101 are the following suburbs. They are Highgate Hill, South Brisbane and West End. So if you live at Fairfield or Dutton Park and you rely on this bridge, you're not included. Um, I don't think this is a fair or equitable process and I do not support this, um, uh, this process uh, and the way in which this um, matter is being applied by Council. Finally, on the advertising interim local law, as I did when this matter came to Council the first time round, I moved an amendment uh, calling on Council to uh, look at uh, character areas. Um, of course, Council voted that down uh, a few weeks ago. Um, I note that they've done no consultation about this local law. Um, they've rammed it through with the state government. They're going to tick it off today with no consultation with anybody. Um, this is, uh, in my view, an inadequate um, amendment to the uh, advertising local laws. It does not fix the problem. These huge electric electronic billboards have sprung up all over the city, not just in the CBD, that's all they're interested in. Um, and it is essential that Council looks more broadly at where there should be some controls over these um, huge electronic billboards that shine directly into the road. Um, and it is just unreasonable that they are being put up in uh, character suburbs, in low density areas. Um, and in areas on intersections where they are dangerous and unsafe. Um, I do not support what Council is, uh, is doing here. Um, I note they keep talking about changes to city plan and they'll bring it forward at a later date. Well, it's too late. The damage has been done by your administration's failure uh, to um, act uh, reasonably when it comes to planning matters. Uh, you know, the, the changes to City Plan 2014 um, are still um, causing havoc in our community. And Count, the LNP Councillor Johnston, your time has expired. Further speakers? Anyone? Further speakers? Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on items A, C and G in the ENC report. Uh, other speakers have talked uh, quite well on this already. Councillor Adams and Councillor Hutton on, in item A, the Monia Road and Bellwood Street upgrade, which uh, is being delivered in the infrastructure portfolio, I'm very pleased to see. Um, and this is an important safety project that will reduce severe accidents that have been occurring at this intersection on uh, this important uh, road on Brisbane's south side. They're, they're, these are both roads that are in, uh, critical roads in the transport network. Um, Monia Road provides an important east-west connection between the Centenary Highway and Oxley Road. It carries uh, over 11,500 vehicles a day, but a, a significant number of those are heavy vehicles. Um, and looking at this road design, the, it's a, there's a slight bend in Monia Road, a curve, it's a bit a blind corner, and vehicles turning um, out of Bellwood don't get a, a good view of the traffic that's on Monio, I'm thinking is the significant issue, and that can be addressed by this intersection upgrade. Um, the item before us is for a, a slight uh, triangle of land to be taken off the corner block, um, Monia and Bellwood, uh, and that will provide for a number of things with a, a small truncation of that land. Um, it will be replacing the existing stop signs with traffic lights to signalise all approaches to the intersection. Uh, as well as uh, traffic lights, the project will deliver new bike lanes uh, on Monia Road and a pedestrian refuge. So these are, as the roads are designated as primary freight routes uh, for the city, the project will also improve the road geometry at this intersection uh, to provide access for B double heavy vehicles from Monia Road to Bellwood Street. Um, so, as I said, the uh, item before us is specifically, though, for that presumption of land that's required, and I'm pleased to hear that that has the support of everyone in this place. Um, Mr Chair, the, uh, at item C, the uh, significant contracting plan for infrastructure design consultancy services, um, the, during the process of designing and developing infrastructure projects, Council does rely on the expertise of many different consultants um, and for several years we have turned to 
the Infrastructure Design Consultancy Services panel to assist with various projects across, across Brisbane. And uh, I heard uh, um, Councillor Cassidy with his uh, obsession with Kingston Smith Drive in reference to this project, talking about consultancy services and how uh, an internal team would have found more of the services that were first built in the, in the 1800s. Well, good, good luck on that, Councillor Cassidy, but he did talk about the KSD effect, and indeed there is a KSD effect, Mr Chair. It's the nearly one million people who've used the infrastructure along Kingsmith Drive for active transport, for cycling, for walking, for jogging uh, on infrastructure that wouldn't have been built if the Labor Party had its way. Uh, and, and th thankfully, we are in this place. We've gone ahead with that project and we've delivered infrastructure that will serve the test of time for, for, for a, a good uh, many decades to come. And, uh, and we hear a constant claim that uh, there's inefficiencies when there's contingencies added to project costs. Well, uh, I'd suggest you put that question to your friend Mark Bailey and see how he's going on Cross River Rail. Uh, Mr. Mr Chair, to come back to, to this item, um, we are looking at the way that uh, consultancies uh, in this place uh, are put onto the panel. Uh, the question was asked earlier about the, the number of suppliers in that regard. Uh, I understand that it'll be a minimum of 35 uh, suppliers, but it may be more, depending on whether they meet the, the criteria that have been established for going on to the panel, uh, which is the, the normal process for determining who goes on onto that panel. Uh, so uh, for the claims of malfeasance that I heard earlier, uh, not so. Uh, this is the, the process that our procurement team goes, goes through, and uh, there will be a good number of suppliers available to us. Many of those will be smaller suppliers, and they'll get a chance to provide services to council that they may not have previously had the opportunity to participate in. Um, Mr Chair, item G, the last item I wanted to talk to was the Newman Wecker Road upgrade. Again, partial property resumptions required here. This is uh, uh, a, one of the bigger junctions in the southern suburbs of our city. It carries an average of 35,000 vehicles a day, uh, 474 buses, a number of uh, pedestrians and cyclists also use that route, provides connection to a large commercial precinct as well as the Mount Gravatt East State School. Um, so, and there have been a number of, uh, of crashes recorded at this particular location. Um, so as the Deputy Mayor has mentioned, the project will construct new turning lanes, a new right turn lane on Newman Road, northbound with a dedicated right turn arrow to fully control the turn into Wecker Road. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a very much needed project. I'm grateful for the support of the federal government in particular for this project. This is one of eight projects that will be delivered with, uh, in partnership with the Australian government in the next few years as we continue, Mr Chair, to focus on building better roads for Brisbane. Further speakers? Councillor Huang. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on item D and E of the ENC report, both on Brisbane Metro. Mr Chair, as we know, Brisbane Metro is a game changer in Brisbane's public transport network and a symbol of progress for Brisbane as a new world city. Brisbane Metro demonstrated the vision and leadership of a city government that is investing in vital infrastructure that in other states should be delivered by the state government. I commend this LMP administration for the courage on taking on the task and providing the people of Brisbane the world-class public trans transport system that we deserve. Mr. Chair, item D and E on design and construction of Burenda and Griffith University busway stations and the investment in Metro Depot are both important steps in progressing the Metro project. Although Biranda and Griffith University stations are not in McGregor Ward, but they are vital stations linking Brisbane's global precincts. Upper Mangravet and ML Plains have been identified as one of Brisbane's global precincts, and the Brisbane Metro is play, playing an important role in linking the technology hub in ML Plains to the business hub at Upper Mangravet and to the education hub in Griffith University and all the way through into our CBD. It is an important corridor for Brisbane's future growth. It will be a key part of Brisbane's greater transport network, connecting the city to the suburbs. Rather than hundreds of buses traveling into the city, they'll link with high capacity and high frequency metro services, 
running along dedicated busways. That means more available buses for the suburbs and less bus congestion in the city. Mr. Chair, investment in infrastructure is vital for the future of Brisbane. The Metro Depot in Rochdale will be one of the biggest in the country at approximately 10 hectares in size. It will house the most advanced technology due not only to the metro vehicles themselves, but also the combination of high and low voltage charging infrastructure that will sit both beneath the ground and on the surface for the award-winning metro vehicle. The depot will achieve a five-star Green Star rating. Green Star, that is, as we know, a comprehensive voluntary environmental rating system which assesses the sustainability attributes of a project through a range of impact categories and will be constructed at school roads, Rochdale, and provide two access points to the southeast busway, which is, which is adjacent to the site. Mr. Chair, I commend the Shrina administration for vision, leadership, and resolve in advancing the project, and I commend the report to the chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak uh, briefly on item B, and in particular contract 7, which relates to external legal consulting services. And uh, I must say I was uh, somewhat flabbergasted that uh, Councillor Johnston would get up this week and put the second foot in her mouth. When we bought, uh, on the 20th of October, we bought a stores board submission here for significant contracting plan for legal consulting services. And in that plan, we outlined that we were going to go to market to seek a new panel of uh, lawyers, a panel that would allow for smaller firms to apply with further um, categories. No, no objections, please. And at the time, Councillor Johnston jumped up and said, Oh, well, well, you're appointing all the big firms again. Well, in fact, what she was pointing Councilor out at Johnston, that point in time... Councillor Johnston, if you interject time, again, I'll have to make an order. Councillor What Allen. she was pointing out at that point in time was she was listing the current panel. She hadn't read the document, but she assumed something, and off she went. It was embarrassing at that point in time, and today she's done it again. Here we have today an extension a contract extension with the same firms to allow council to go about the process of undertaking the tender for legal services. So two times, two times Councilor she's Johnston, got her facts wrong in this please chamber. Please cease interjecting or I will make an order against you. Councillor Allen. So all I can say, Mr Chair, is I'd really encourage Councillor Johnston to read the papers before she engages her mouth and gets up here and embarrasses herself. It's extremely clear what's being proposed here. It was outlined in the document that came to the Chamber on the 20th of the 10th, and she's got it wrong again today. Thank you. Further speakers? Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Claim to be misrepresented. Uh, there's no speech occurring at this time. Further speakers? I claim to be misrepresented. The speech was... Con what? Yeah. Yeah. He, he finished Allen. by saying, and she's got it wrong again, and I'm saying I am claiming to All be right, misrepresented. Well, this better be real. Councillor yeah. Johnston. Please proceed. It's not OK. You're the chair, Can and it's not OK. No, Councillor Johnston. It's just not. Councillor Can Johnston. I be clear? No, 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 you can't, obviously. You, you have trouble with that. Look, here's the, here's the problem, right? No, don't speak over me. Councillor Johnston, I consider that you are displaying unsuitable meeting conduct and in accordance with section 21.5 of the Meetings Local Law 2001, I hereby you request, you request that you cease calling me names, making things up and accusing me of things that are not true. Point and I'm afraid from doing it for the balance of the meeting. Point of order, Mr. Chair. No, I'm still dealing with the other one. Now, Councillor Johnson, Point I've directed order. you... I moved I've directed, in your ruling. I've directed you to cease calling me names. Um, as your comments, as always, are deeply unfair and not true. Uh, and now you have uh, sought to uh, make a misrepresentation claim against uh, Councillor Allen. 
and in doing so, in your requesting to do that, you have uh, accused me of all kinds of wild things which are obviously not true. Uh, I will now call upon you to make your, your statement of misrepresentation. Please limit your comments to the actual subject that you wish to talk about and no more. Point of order, I move dissent in your ruling and I would appreciate a second. Seconded. Uh, there has been a motion of dissent against me calling Councillor Johnston to speak on a misrepresentation. All of those who think that I was wrong to do that, please say aye. aye. And those against, please say no. Don't be ridiculous no. yet again. No. The, the I'm not allowed to interrupt you when you're speaking, as the rules say. I move. Councillor, Councillor Johnston, um, you. No, I'm not putting up with this. Councillor Johnston, you I moved... am not putting no. up with you okay. having a go at me like this every single time. If I rise on a point of order, I expect you to apply the rules appropriately. Councillor Johnston, you have failed to comply with the request to take remedial action for your unsuitable meeting conduct. I hereby warn you in accordance with section 21.7 of the Meetings Local Law 2001 that failing to comply with the request may result in an order being issued. Now... Do you want to make your, your statement about misrepresentation or not? Councillor Allen said that what I said was incorrect. I actually just pointed out under the uh, matter before us today that the administration was reappointing these major national Thank and you. multinational that, that's not a corporations. Misrepresentation. That's a second speech. All right, point, point, of, order, point of order, Councillor Landers. Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Second. Before you move on, Councillor Johnston, you have again called me a name that is not true, uh, and I've, I've directed you to stop doing it many times. Therefore, Councillor Johnston, as you continue to fail to comply with the request to take remedial action for your unsuitable meeting conduct in accordance with Section 21.9 of the Meetings Local Law 2001, I hereby make an order reprimanding you for your conduct. Uh, your conduct and this reprimand will be noted in the minutes of this meeting. I have a motion to go to afternoon tea from Councillor Landers. Is there a seconder? Seconded. Seconded by Councillor Hutton. Uh, councillors, the, the uh, resolution is that this council now adjourned for a period of 15 minutes, beginning when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, no. The ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I rise to speak in regards to item I, which is the advertisements interim local law. Um, and uh, following on from the Acting Mayor's uh, earlier speech, I really want to thank the Lord Mayor and ENC very much for their support uh, of this important change uh, to the local law regarding advertising signs. Um, as the Chamber knows, um, this issue arose uh, through uh, an LED billboard uh, within Paddington Ward uh, in an area that has uh, a character residential overlay. Uh, although the officers at the time made the assessment, the community um, did not agree with that assessment and that was fully understandable and I supported them in regards to that. And so made the necessary representations in regards to what was obviously a, a necessary change needed within the local law to address that concern. Uh, and the work that has been done by officers is obviously substantial and has provided the opportunity uh, and the guidance to officers uh, in regards to what I think is important community expectations around protecting local areas uh, from LED billboards uh, and trying to find that balance uh, between the, uh, the community's needs and uh, also the commerciality of some landowners and advertising companies. I think that these changes uh, meet that. Um, obviously, uh, as the Acting Mayor said, it is an interim local law uh, and we will continue to get feedback uh, from the state uh, uh, as required in regards to it. But certainly Clause 12 in particular and its recognition of heritage places uh, and also land that is identified within a commercial character building uh, overlay provides a necessary improvement, I think, to the overall uh, previous uh, local law. And so um, I think this is a perfect example, uh, Mr Chair, of where 
um, uh, the community's voice is properly heard uh, and that through, uh, through representation and through the ability to listen to uh, community uh, concerns and also expectations generally that we can get positive change uh, within our local laws. It clearly shows that uh, this administration is listening to those concerns and dealing with them in a prompt fashion. And I have to say that from, uh, from where it started to where it is now uh, has been uh, a great outcome and, and, and been done in a timely manner. Uh, and I look forward to uh, this process continuing on and uh, uh, at, at some point in the future, uh, getting through the changes that we need to so that we can lock and load uh, this law uh, from interim to full. But certainly this has been a substantial improvement on where we are and uh, a great outcome for the community as a whole. Thank you. Further speakers? Any further speakers? Councillor Murphy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I uh, intend to speak on item D, E, F, H, and maybe item G, if I get the time. Um, in order, Chair, item D is to seek approval to directly enter into a sole source contract with the Brisbane Move Consortium, comprising uh, Athiona Construction Australia and Arab Australia Projects for the design and construction of the upgrades to the Buranda and Griffith University busway stations without going to tender again. This is in accordance with Council's SP103 procurement policy and plan. And um, Chair, you'll recall that we entered into a collaborative partnership with uh, Brisbane Move Consortium to deliver the inner city infrastructure and the associated works for Brisbane Metro in October 2020, following a competitive tendering process. A condition precedent for the commencement of the collaborative partnership was uh, the granting of an approval by the Queensland Government for Council to undertake works on the busway, which is an asset of the State of Queensland. TMR has uh, granted approval to Council under the Transport Infrastructure Act 1994 to carry out works on busway transport infrastructure for the Brisbane Metro project. And a condition of that approval is that Council also undertakes busway upgrade works at the Buranda and Griffith busway stations. So the works at the Buran and Griffith University are outside the council approved scope of the collaborative partnership. Concept designs, cost estimates and delivery options for these additional works have now been developed and this submission seeks approval to deliver these works via uh, the collaborative partnership through a uh, project principle directed scope variation. Chair. Since late 2017, more than 500 meetings have occurred between the Queensland Government and Council to progress Brisbane Metro. And despite the setbacks, I'm pleased to confirm that in September, two deeds of agreement were executed between Council uh, and the Department of Transport and Main Roads, which have resulted in approval for the Collaborative Partnership to undertake these works to deliver these new busway assets and hand them over to the Queensland Government. While it's good news for the project, it's disappointing that Council was in the position for these agreements to be reached in October of 2018 following the draft design uh, report consultation where we submitted a proposal to the Queensland Government to enable these projects uh, to progress with certainty. Unfortunately, instead of taking the opportunity for the Queensland Government uh, owned and operated assets to be upgraded to ensure that they can continue to service prison in the future, politics uh, was a priority at the time and, and uh, these essential works have been delayed uh, by two years. So the works at Griffith University will be tendered to local construction industry via the collaborative partnership. And I mean, that was clear in the document, so I don't know why uh, it was talked about before that this was all going uh, to Asiona. This will provide an opportunity for local contractors to benefit and to tender uh, for works on this revolutionary project for Brisbane. Now, the works in Buranda are a lot more complex than the works at Griffith, so they will be delivered by Brisbane Move. Um, and just out of interest, uh, Chair, the, uh, in terms of modelling for the Buranda Station, Council modelling suggested uh, in the October 2018 report that the Buranda Station without uh, the, uh, that project would have a forecast of an average delay of 61 seconds in the 2021 AM peak, increasing to 99 seconds in 2031 without the project, and a, uh, with the project delay of 35 seconds in the 2021 AM peak, increasing to 85 seconds in 2031. So by, by 2031, we're talking uh, an on, on average saving of 15 seconds. So um, this is certainly a very significant cost to council uh, to deliver this additional work that the state has asked us to do. It's not necessary for Metro to work, but it is something that the state government wanted us to do anyway, and council really had no choice but to accept the terms that the state was offering. Uh, as we've heard, the uh, estimated commitment by council under this contract is $46 million. 
Um, and I hope that the state government can now work with us collaboratively to deliver an investment in our transport network that's good for all of Brisbane and all of South East Queensland. Uh, now on to uh, item E, which is the rejection of the claim for compensation and approval to pay in advance against compensation rising from the resumption on 59 School Road Rochdale. Uh, we know that uh, this is the site for the Brisbane Metro Depot. It's required for the stabling and the maintenance of the Metro vehicles. And the vehicles will be substantially longer than the existing bus fleet. So we will require specialist charging infrastructure that cannot be accommodated in any uh, footprint of the depots that we currently have within council. So we need uh, essentially more land to build the depot. Council officers identified School Road Rochdale as a preferred Metro Depot site, and this site has the ability uh, for future growth of the Metro fleet. So if we want to add more vehicles later, we have the capacity to do so at School Road. Under the Acquisition of Land Act 19, uh, 1967, a property owner that was affected by resumption is entitled to claim compensation for that res resumption. A claimant affected by resumption is also entitled to claim professional fees incurred. Um, in the case of 59 School Road, council officers haven't been provided with sufficient evidence to evaluate all the professional fees and the purchase costs that have been claimed, or evidence to determine if holding costs and costs of failing to settle on replacement of replacement property are reasonable. So item, a, item E simply recommends that the proposed claim is rejected and that a claim for compensation uh, that we pay an advance against that uh, according to what, what we agree uh, to pay. And we will settle the details later. And I thank Councillor Cassidy for his uh, support on this item. Item F is the Dockside Ferry Terminal, and um, as we've heard, Council continues to roll out a program of ferry terminal upgrades to make sure that all of our terminals meet DDA compliance to improve connectivity and accessibility in our city that the, that the Acting Mayor was talking about that's so important just before. Um, this includes upgrades at Dockside, Mowbray Park, South Bank, and a new state-of-the-art terminal at the Howard Smith Wharves. I shared with the Chamber last week the development application for the Mowbray Park Terminal uh, has now been lodged, and assessment of that is underway. Uh, and this submission will facilitate the important works at Dockside Terminal. Now, as we've heard, Dockside Terminal is 30 years old. Accessibility standards have changed a great deal since then. Uh, and with this, we will apply for a resumption uh, from the Department of Natural Resources and Mines to resume the land uh, that we need to get started with the project. So the terminal itself is currently functional, but it's in a very poor condition and it's not compliant with current accessibility standards. The upgrade will allow for monohull services and also will future-proof the terminal for uh, city cat services as well. Um, I know Councillor Cassidy asked the question, why are we upgrading this terminal uh, and not Norman, pa Norman Park? And the answer to that, I, ca I can't be any clearer. People actually use this terminal. Uh, people actually show up, they use the services at the dockside terminal, they use the services at Mowbray Park. Uh, wherever we are upgrading terminals, people are using those terminals. Um, and, and that is not the case with the Norman Park terminal. It's a terminal that's used by 133 people on average for 136 services that run there daily. Uh, that is not a public transport service, that is a water taxi, uh, and that is not something uh, that it is in ratepayers' best interest to be subsidising, particularly given that that terminal was the end of life and ratepayers would have to expend a significant amount of money to upgrade it to bring it up to standard. So um, the completion of these works at Dockside um, will allow us to continue uh, our mission of ensuring that 100 per cent of Council's terminals are DDA compliant to ensure uh, that people will be able to get around our city no matter uh, how uh, they do that and, and, and uh, regardless of any disabilities that they may have. Finally, uh, Chair, on item H, because I am running out of time, um, the go between bridge toll credit scheme. Uh, as part of the Brisbane Metro project, Chair, as you'll know, we've undertaken significant engagement with the Queensland Government to pro progress this project. And uh, providing a toll credit scheme on the go between bridge for local residents during the construction uh, of the Metro project and removal of general traffic from Victoria Bridge is one of the conditions that the Queensland Government set out in order to allow Brisbane Metro to progress. Um, a number of options prov for providing relief to local residents were considered following the assessment of these options and consultation within various areas of council and as well with uh, our partners at Transurban Queensland Council is proposing that a fixed toll credit be provided to private households which have a toll account in the 4101 postcode area. Transurban Queensland manage the go-between bridge and will implement provision of the credit while Council will undertake administration of the scheme, including establishing eligibility criteria and processing applications. A credit of $100 
per eligible toll account household per annum will be available to a maximum credit of $400 per eligible toll account and household over the life of the relief scheme. Only class one and class two vehicles, so that's motorcycles Point and of order, Chair. cars. Point of order, Councillor Shree. Will Councillor Murphy take a question? Councillor Murphy, will you take a question? Sure. Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. Through you to Councillor Murphy. Just clarifying, is, is this toll rebate per household or per resident and, and vehicle in the area? Councillor Murphy. It's per household. Yep. So um, it will be able to be used solely for private usage and for those residents living within the 4101 postcode with a valid linked toll account. Um, the purpose of this initiative is to provide that temporary relief for residents in the 4101 postcode to ensure that they can travel to local destinations. But I just want to say, Chair, we've done the modelling on this and we know that 75 per cent of the people uh, who currently go over the Victoria Bridge go over the William Jolly Bridge and 25 per cent people over the Captain Cook. Only 10 per cent of those uh, go over the go-between bridge. So uh, we've known from the start that this was a request from the former local member, uh, Jackie Tra Trad, the member for South Brisbane, uh, and we propose to name this toll subsidy scheme the Jackie Trad Memorial Can Toll Council Subsidy Scheme. Councillor uh, Murphy, we know your she's been a great expired. advocate for South Councilor Brisbane. Murphy, your time's and expired. Further, uh, further speakers? Anyone? Any further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. Um, just wanted to speak briefly on the uh, Dockside Ferry Terminal upgrade. Obviously, I, I welcome the investment in that terminal, and it's, it's good to see that um, that terminal will be brought up to modern accessibility standards. I do think um, some of the issues and complications with this terminal highlight the flaws of allowing private developers to responsibility for developing the riverfront and the ownership structures around Dockside are, uh, and unnecessarily complex, and I think that reflects poorly on previous decision makers in this administration going back some years now. But that particular terminal upgrade does highlight the broader flaws and failures in public transport planning for the Kangaroo Point Peninsula because we now have a situation where the Thornton Street terminal is out of action and, according to the LNP administration, won't be restored. The dockside terminal will soon be offline while it's getting um, repaired or restored uh, or upgraded. And the Mowbray Park City Cat terminal, the next terminal along in East Brisbane, is also going to be going offline while it gets restored. Um, meanwhile, the much appreciated interim introduction of City Cats to the Holman Street terminal has now ceased. So for a brief period there, Kangaroo Point residents were able to get City Cats at Holman Street, but now that, that service is discontinued as well which means that between Hawthorne and South Bank, there will be no city cats stopping on the southern side of the river anywhere along that entire precinct. This is something that the Chair of City Planning needs to pay close attention to because um, that area of council is responsible for cramming so many additional residents into that Kangaroo Point Peninsula, but it's also something that I'm sure Councillor Murphy is, is aware of. Um, as I said, no city cat stops anywhere between South Bank and Hawthorne on the southern side of the river. Um, that's a si significant problem in, in the medium term while these terminals are out of action and being upgraded. And I think really adds weight to the argument that we should be restoring city cat services to Holman Street on an ongoing basis. I've provided that feedback to the council administration already and we've also got uh, a survey of residents showing very strong support for city cats to start stopping at Holman Street again. And residents who've participated in that survey have said very clearly that it is a high priority for them to have the city cats stopping at Holman Street than it is for the Cross River Ferry Service to be stopping at Holman Street. So presented with a choice, Kangaroo Point residents are very clearly saying that their preferences uh, for the free city hopper and the city cat services to stop at Holman Street. And even if that means that the paid cross river service can't stop at Holman Street, that's okay if the city cat is stopping there. This is an important piece of information that need, the administration needs to take account of because the administration is closing down Thornton Street Terminal permanently and closing down Dockside and Mowbray Park Terminals temporarily while they're upgraded. So there's a significant reduction right now in public transport coverage for the Kangaroo Point Peninsula, which could last for some time. And even once the Dockside and Mowbray Park terminals are back online, there's still a net reduction in public transport services for the, because of that loss of Thornton Street. 
Now, I understand the administration's arguments that there's a new footbridge going in. I understand the arguments that you can't have ferries stopping at Thornton Street while the bridge is under construction. But that doesn't take away from the fact that this administration is cutting public transport services, cutting public transport services in, an, in a city area where the population is increasing dramatically and where traffic congestion is in, increasing dramatically. And when this administration's own Transport for, for Brisbane strategy says that, there's, that you are supposed to be improving public transport services, encouraging people to use public and active transport, and shifting residents away from dependency on motor vehicles. So I think it's incumbent upon this administration to explain how they can justify cutting public transport services, creating a net reduction in public transport services for the inner south side, and forcing more people to rely on private motor vehicles. That's, ex that's what's happening here. It's, it's, um, it, it's surprise I think it would have generated even more outrage if the administration hadn't snuck these de decisions in under the cover of a state election. But there's a serious concern here where this council administration is reducing public transport coverage in contradiction to its own Transport for Brisbane strategy, in contradiction to its own stated aim of increasing and improving public transport coverage for local residents, and is then celebrating this as a good thing and saying, oh, no, it's great, we're up upgrading the dockside ferry terminal. Yeah, that's really good. But you're cutting public transport services for a high-density precinct. And it's, it's, it's great that we're getting the foot, footbridge, and I'm, I'm certainly not critical of that. I think that's a really positive project for the area. But not everyone um, is mobile enough to take advantage of that footbridge to get into the CBD. Um, and the Thornton Street Terminal was not just being used to access the CBD. Um, the Thornton Street Terminal, like the Dockside Terminal, is also used to access other points along the river to catch the ferry to New Farm or to catch the ferry down to South Bank or to the other side of um, the CBD. So shutting down that Thornton Street ferry terminal is dramatically reducing accessibility and connectivity for residents, both while the bridge is under construction and even in the long term. So I'm, I'm pleased to see the Dockside Terminal getting upgraded. I'm, I'm, I celebrate that and, and I thank the administration for investing that money where it's very much needed. But the Local Government Infrastructure Plan also identified around $8 million of investment to upgrade the Thornton Street Terminal. That's there in the LGIP. Um, residents can look it up in the online documents. The LGIP says the Council will upgrade the Thornton Street Ferry Terminal to um, make, make that compliant with DDA standards. Um, so Council already identified and planned to upgrade that terminal and has now backed away from that commitment. And that's very, very concerning. Uh, and, and so I, I implore this administration to recognise that when you cut public transport services in an inner city neighbourhood, that means more of those residents are going to drive, which causes more traffic congestion, which in turn negatively impacts the broader traffic network. So this is not just about residents in that part of Kangaroo Point. This is about every motorist who uses Shaftston Avenue and Main Street and the Story Bridge. Because if the hundreds and hundreds, if not the, hundred, the thousands, in fact, the thousands of residents who were using that Thornton Street ferry terminal, if even a small proportion of those start driving instead to get around, that's going to create more traffic congestion on inner city bottlenecks and pinch points that are already at capacity. So um, through you, Chair, Councillor David McLaughlin, as Chair of Infrastructure, needs to be looking at this very closely as well and recognising that reductions in public transport are going to have negative impacts in terms of the congestion reduction objectives of this administration as well. So I don't want the administration to be patting itself on the back and, and feeling like it's, it's um, done a really good thing for the area because it's followed through with investments on terminal upgrades that have been identified for years now and um, that everyone agreed would happen. Um, that's sort of routine business at this point. But what I am concerned about is the loss of those public transport services for the Kangaroo Point Peninsula and the fact that this administration doesn't seem to be seriously engaging with the concerns, not just from Kangaroo Point residents, but also those around Norman Park who've also lost their ferry service. Um, these public transport reductions do not make sense. They are contrary to modern transport planning principles. And this administration is increasingly looking like it's very backwards and car-centric in its, in its planning approach to transport. And I think that needs to change. And I think um, 
through you, Chair, the Deputy Mayor, who spent some time as the Chair of Public and Active Transport, should surely understand how concerning this is, that, that this Council administration would pu cut public transport services in a precinct that's right next to St Vincent's private hospital, where there are elderly residents who definitely can't, aren't going to be able to walk, a lot, walk across that bridge to the CBD, but who, who very much appreciated being able to jump on the city hopper at Thornton Street so they could catch it down to South Bank or so, so they could catch it over to New Farm. Those, those residents will suffer and experience a material loss of accessibility and be cut off from, from the rest of the city if there's not some alternative public transport service restored for the Thornton Street precinct. At present, we have that um, shuttle service that stops up, at, up near the Story Bridge Hotel, but that's also a long walk away from the Thornton Street precinct and in and of itself is not a, a sufficient substitute for the service that's being cut here. Further speakers? I see no further speakers. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair, and I thank all the uh, councillors for their input this afternoon. I just wanted to reiterate some of the points that were discussed this afternoon. It's interesting what we hear from the councillors sit on the front bench on the opposition. We have got one councillor that is, oh, woe is me, I never get anything. Um, no offence to Councillor Hutton, happy she's getting an upgrade, but why aren't I getting one, which we hear quite a bit. And then, of course, Councillor Shree, who is about to get the largest, the largest of any councillor in this place investment in public transport through a green bridge and a terminal upgrade, complaining about the lack of public transport in the Kangaroo Point Peninsula. This from a councillor who decides now and then with his mates from Extinction Rebellion to cut off the entire peninsula for hours on end on a Sunday so no one can get in and out. So what we have here is an upgrade to a terminal that's long been identified in the LGIP, and we're getting on and doing it. And yes, there'll be some short-term pain for long-term gain, but there is a shuttle bus that at much cost to council is put on to replace that, and I understand has been very popular during all of the, the city hopper stoppages and waiting for the city cat, and will continue to go through the works while we have the dockside terminal um, being upgraded as well. And then, of course, the Kangaroo Point Bridge. Hands up if you'd like a $190 million bridge of public transport from your area and your ward straight into the CBD, where that, that active transport, I should say, sorry, thank you, Councillor Cassie, I'll take your injection. Active transport, e-mobility, I'm always listening, I just don't always agree. Uh, e-mobility, e-mobility options. I mean, you can be on a motorised scooter. Okay, and when I say motorised scooter, I mean a scooter that's a wheelchair motorised scooter and use that public transport as well. There is going to be a range of ways to use that, to use that bridge, but we are absolutely delivering for the people of Kangaroo Point. And we are not ashamed to say, yes, there will be some short-term pain, but the gain for that area will be astronomical for what this administration is doing for the infrastructure of Kangaroo Point. And it's a shame that Councillor Shree can't see through the trees to the park beyond. Councillors, I'll now put items A, F, G and I. All those in favour of A, F, G and I, please say aye. Aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, item B. All those in favour of item B, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Strunk. Please ring the bells.
Councillors on item B. Councillors on item B, all those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. Those against, please say no and raise your hand. And abstentions, please raise your hand. Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the no, the, sorry, the ayes have it. The voting being 19 in favour and five abstentions. The ayes have it. Councillors on items C, D and E. All those in favour of items C, D and E, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. And councillors on my item H. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. The ayes have it. That concludes the ENC report. Councillors, the City Planning and Economic Development Committee, please. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 10th of November 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by uh, the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Council Landers, the report of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 10th of November 2020 be adopted. Is there any, any debate? Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. Last week's presentation was on 62 Ann Street in the city, which is Suncorp's new headquarters, and we probably all know it as the place that slows us down a little bit on Ann Street as we go through in the evening as well. The presentation to committee last week was regarding a minor change to the original approval, but I thought it was timely that it came back to the committee so we could really look at some of the fantastic outcomes we are getting for clean and green and sustainable building and construction in our city. The original approval granted in 2018 secured a total of 70,000 square metres of office space with 5,000 square metres of outdoor space at ground level. In addition to this, there are 660 bicycle spaces as well as 65 showers and over 1,000 lockers. If you've been in the city for a few years, you'll remember the beautiful building that was the Department of Primary Industries. This is what we're going to have in its place. It has also got a six-star green star rating. So the minor change application approved proposed uh, to facilitate interim arrangements and this is exactly what we wanted to help um, applications with as we're going through economic recovery to make sure that we could get temporary access arrangements with the building management so they could actually stage the development and move some workers in early while they were still developing on stage two. So the arrangements were around servicing and waste collection, bicycle parking, temporary access arrangements and uh, that will allow the Suncorp workers to get into the building earlier or on time, as the case may be, and they can continue with stage two. The approval will help keep around 1,800 office workers in the city, a great outcome for small businesses within the CBD. Further speakers? Anyone at all? Councillor Adams? I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour of item A, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillor is the Public and Active Transport Committee. Councillor Murphy. It's uh, not working. Okay, now it's working. Thanks, Chair. I'm sensing some people want to get home for Origin. Uh, Chair, Tomorrow, I, mate. <laughs> I Tomorrow move night. that the. Uh, <laughs> all right. Yes. <laughs> you can. You can tell I'm a real sportsman. <laughs> Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Public and Active Transport Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 10th of November 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by, moved by Councillor Murphy, seconded by Councillor Landers. The report of the Public and Active Transport Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 10th of November 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Murphy. Just briefly, Chair, last week's presentation was on the CityLink Cycleway. This project, uh, as we all know, will deliver a trial bi-directional bikeway through the heart of our city, and it's jointly funded by the Council and the Queensland State Government. Team Schrinner and, of course, the Lord Mayor personally is focused on making active transport a safer and more appealing option for Brisbane residents, and we know that separated bike lanes is the best way to do that. Brisbane has a great network of bikeways and river walks that get us to the edge of the CBD. Uh, in fact, our bikeways are the busiest that they've been in years. Uh, but when it comes to the final distance into the city, it's clear that there's a missing link. And that's why we're working with the state government to implement trial bike lanes uh, from the city reach boardwalk to South Brisbane along Edward Street, all the way along Elizabeth Street, uh, the Victoria Bridge and uh, Albert Street as well. 
Now, this, um, this is not new. This actually comes from the Transport Plan for Brisbane, um, which is the plan that provides a framework for managing and developing our transport network over the next 25 years. It supports the development of an inner city transport network based around safe and accessible active transport and access to high capacity, high frequency public transport. And the CityLink cycleway trial is an important part of us being able to reach uh, that objective. So in terms of um, uh, selecting an, an, an appropriate alignment, safety, uh, connectivity and comfort uh, were the top three considerations when designing the network. The project involves a, a two-way separated bi-directional uh, bike lane. It uh, will occupy one of the curbside traffic lanes and wherever possible the bike lane will run in the right-hand uh, side in terms of the direction of travel. This is to maximise safety for everyone so that bus drivers and truck drivers can always see cyclists because God knows we've had uh, far too many uh, cyclist and truck incidents in our city. We don't want to see any more of those. Construction will start later this month and I'm uh, pleased to advise today that we've awarded uh, the contract for construction of CityLink Cycleway to Abigeldi Constructions, no stranger uh, to working uh, for council in constrained uh, environments just like the CBD. Uh, they work with us on a number of projects and I'm sure they will equip themselves well uh, on CityLink Cycleway. Um, Elizabeth Street was selected as it provides a direct connection into the core of the city and Edward Street will have a protected bike lane from Elizabeth Street down uh, to the Botanic Gardens. This connects directly into the City Reach Boardwalk and the Botanic Gardens through the Goodwill Bridge and surrounding pathways. The network will provide uh, those meaningful connections immediately and it will complement future projects if the trial is successful. Um, it will seamlessly connect with Council's future Kangaroo Point Greenbridge and it will be one of our city's most used walking and cycling connections and that is why our modelling has suggested this route. It will complement other projects being delivered as part of Queen's Wharf Brisbane and uh, Cross River Rail's eventual transformation of Albert Street. Uh, now this is a 12 month trial to run concurrently with community consultation and it's very important for people uh, to see these bike lanes in action so uh, we can get meaningful feedback. We want to understand whether this is something uh, the Brisbane residents support and something that they want to see us roll out uh, more widely. If supported, um, we will consider extending the network uh, into such destinations as South Brisbane. Uh, and I, I very strongly believe that a lot of the success of us being able to roll out this infrastructure elsewhere will hang uh, off the ability to have the success of this trial in one of the uh, city's most constrained environments. So if we can get it here, we know that it will be able to work anywhere. The trial will involve light touch infrastructure such as yellow separation, uh, curb, uh, curb separators, green paint and bike signals at intersections. So there'll be some intersections that will have a bike phase, some that will go with traffic, some that will go with pedestrians. Council will retain uh, on-street signage and infrastructure like parking meters in case the status quo needs to be restored, God forbid, at the end of the 12-month trial. Um, there's no doubt that there'll be changes um, as part of this trial, especially when it comes to parking in the city, relocation uh, of, of a number of bus services and uh, changes to loading zones throughout the CBD. Uh, but Council has to consider the best use of publicly owned road space. Um, when someone jumps on a bike, when they leave their car at home, they're contributing to congestion reduction. Um, Chair, you might uh, be surprised to know that on average one car in Brisbane carries uh, 1.1 people, uh, but it takes up the same space as five people riding a bike. And since January 2020, active travel has increased by 16% in Brisbane, and the number of people riding uh, a bike to work in the city has more than doubled between 2006 and 2016. Anecdotally, we know uh, that local bike sales are up by 200%, and e-scooter sales are soaring through the roof. Council's working with the state to see if we can accommodate e-scooters on these bike lanes. Um, and uh, I'm hopeful that we will, uh, we will get an outcome with that soon that we'll be able to, uh, to announce to the Chamber. So a number of cities around the world have relocated road space for walking and cycling during the COVID-19 pandemic and many of those cities have had mixed results. We've learned that reactive measures such as pop-up infrastructure won't necessarily work in a post-COVID uh, society. This administration is focused on getting a permanent solution to the real problems uh, that cities have in congestion. And I'm excited to see that CityLink Cycleway uh, will soon be off and running and under construction. And hopefully we'll be able to open the first stage of CityLink Cycleway uh, before Christmas as an early Christmas present to ratepayers. Um, 
Chair, we also have a petition requesting council install bicycle lanes as part of the road resurfacing works on Junction Road Morningside. Uh, I know that uh, Councillor uh, Atwood is here, but Councillor Cook is an ap uh, apology, so um, I will leave debate the Chamber. And I had a question on notice from uh, Councillor Sri, who asked a question as to whether uh, there was a requirement for road resurfacing to replace uh, lanes like for like uh, in the uh, schedule, and uh, or, or whether th uh, the intent of that budget is, is to reallocate existing road space. Uh, the answer is that uh, generally uh, works on that schedule will replace like for like, uh, but where there's an opportunity uh, to, to put in new curb lane markings, uh, we will of course be happy to investigate that, and I believe that's what that petition says, and I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak on the CBD bike lanes project and to congratulate the administration for its excellent work in bringing forward this project. I think it's really positive to see um, the councils finally getting on board with the need to create more separated bike lanes around the inner city, and I, I think this is a genuinely positive step, and I, I welcome it wholeheartedly. Um, obviously, I'm a bit disappointed it, it wasn't a bit bigger in scope. Um, and in particular, I'd, I would have liked to see the bike lanes stretch further up Edward Street, but I, I do acknowledge that there are challenges and um, the council has a lot of stakeholders to, to balance in this project. Um, I'm also mindful of the importance of getting the connections right across the, and to and across the Victoria Bridge, and I hope that the council administration will consult closely with me as a directly affected councillor, even though the project doesn't itself fall within my ward. I think. Um, particularly the timing of intersection signals around um, North Quay and, and William Street and, and those connections through to the Victoria Bridge and then onto the south side will be very important to pay attention to. And I do sometimes worry that those small details of these bikeway projects get lost when um, city projects is working to tight timelines. So I, I hope the council officers will be able to come and brief me directly about some of those intersection treatments and, and exactly how um, this project is going to connect through to projects such as the Kangaroo Point footbridge and, and the Victoria Bridge bike lanes. Um, I'm optimistic about how this project's going to go. I'm, I'm already hearing really positive feedback from a lot of cyclists who are really excited about this. Um, I'm also interested to see how council, that, uh, to see that council can deliver bike lanes without having to spend quite as much money and time on what you might call over-engineered concrete separate, separators and infrastructure. One of the, I thought, big flaws of the Wool and Gabba bikeway project was that um, the the need to have to the, the the need to comply with or the perceived need to comply with some of those road design standards ended up with council designing a, a configuration of bike lanes that was probably more expensive than it needed to be and was also more rigid than it needed to be in the sense that it's now very hard to make changes. Um, there are some obvious flaws with the Woolloongabba bikeway project that I expect it's going to take council some time to rectify because by spending so much money on, on the so-called hard infrastructure of concrete barriers, it, it makes it very difficult to make tweaks down the line. Um, so it's, it's quite positive, I think, to see council using a so-called lighter treatment with um, barriers that can, or separators that can easily be dropped in and then easily relocated later down the track if there's a, a more appropriate configuration that, um, that we arrive at. Um, so congratulations to Councillor Murphy, congratulations to the Lord Mayor for supporting this, um, congratulations also to Councillor McLaughlin and Councillor Howard because I'm sure you've had your parts to play in terms of changes to parking and, um, and lane configurations as well. I hope this project goes well and I hope to see a lot more of it in the future. Further speakers? Councillor Atwood. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to throw my support behind the investigation to install uh, cycling lanes along uh, Junction Road, included in the resurfacing there. Like Councillor Murphy said, uh, it's very important that we, include, uh, that we increase our bicycle lanes right across our city. And I really want to thank him for all of his time uh, in doing this. I know out in Doughboy Ward, we've been chatting a lot about the improvements we can make. Um, and we've recently completed a project along Queensport Road in Murray, which has made a terrific outcome for the cycleway there. And yeah, thank you very much. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Just briefly on uh, item A. Um, it is good to see uh, that Council has finally uh, looked at um, better bike facilities uh, in the CBD. That's something I know the Labor Party have raised and Councillor Shree many times in this place over several terms of 
government, and uh, the LNP were always opposed. So it's good to see councillors finally acted. I know that the cycling community will be very happy um, to see uh, some safer arrangements for them in the CBD. Um, however, it's disappointing to see that um, in the suburbs, uh, councils still, I don't know what they're doing, um, but somebody built a build out in the middle of a bike lane at Chelmer yesterday. Um, and asset services don't know anything about it. TNO don't know anything about it. I've spoken to everyone today. So I suspect it's a city project special. Um, everyone is extremely upset um, that it's just appeared, no notice to the, any of the bugs or me or anybody. Um, so whilst it's great that we're seeing an outcome in the city that is well supported by the cycling community uh, and long advocated by uh, councillors in this place, um, we're not seeing that same um, process unfolding in the suburbs and particularly in my ward. Further speakers? Anyone? Councillor Murphy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Uh, look, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Shree and Councillor Atwood for their uh, warm support of this administration's work to enhance uh, cyclist safety and connectivity uh, in our city. It's great to see uh, bipartisan support for cyclists in here. Uh, I know that uh, many of us have taken those rides with the various bug groups across uh, our city, and hopefully that's done uh, some work to increase understanding uh, across the political spectrum as to the challenge, the real challenges that cyclists face uh, with safety in our city. And we don't always get it right. Sometimes uh, we do get it wrong. Uh, and, and that just doesn't, I'm not just talking about council here, I'm talking about state projects, council projects, uh, infrastructure that's delivered by private developers in condition. We don't always uh, get it right, but where we do get it wrong, we're always willing to go back and have a look at that. And um, Councillor Johnson, that issue that you've raised, the minister has raised with me personally, uh, we are looking into it. We hopefully will have a, uh, some answers on that one soon, but it was only just raised uh, with me on Twitter a few hours ago and then uh, with the Minister via text. So uh, we are looking into it and I would agree. Uh, the last thing we want to be doing is having build-outs uh, put into bike lanes. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, we just don't have the details on that one yet. So I'm happy to come back to you next week. All right, I'll now put the, uh, put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Infrastructure Committee report, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 10th of November 2020, be adopted. Second. It's been moved by Councillor McLaughlin, seconded by Councillor Landers. The report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 10th of November 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor McLaughlin? Yeah, a couple of things, Mr Chair. Just briefly on the points just raised about the, that build out on uh, Oxley Road, I can't provide the Chamber with some advice which has just come through um, and be provided to Councillor Murphy as well, but this appears to be TMR. So, Councillor Johnson, to your point, I suggest you talk to your friend Mark, who I know you're on first term, first oh. <laughs> term basis with, and Mark might be able to provide you with some advice because it appears to be a TMR Counc project. Councillors, yeah. uh, um, councillors would direct comments uh, to the Chair, please. Thank you, Mr Chair, through you. <laughs> yeah. um, before I turn to item A, I'd like to remind the Chamber that this week is National Road Safety Week, which is uh, an annual initiative from the Safer Australian Roads and Highways Group. Um, each year, Sarah partners with other road safety organisations and governments who highlight the impact of road trauma and ways to reduce it. Sadly, uh, 1,200 people lost their lives on Australian roads in 2019. This is why initiatives like the Black Spot Program, Roads to Recovery Program and Council's Move Safe Review are so critical. National Road Safety Week, however, is also an important reminder that uh, individual motorists can help prevent accidents and save lives through their own driving behaviour. National Road Safety Week, Mr Chair, encourages Australians to pledge to drive as if their own loved ones are on the road in front of them to never use their mobile phones while driving, to never drive while tired or under the influence, and to slow down and give space to vulnerable road users, such as pedestrians and cyclists. It is, uh, Mr Chair, very fitting that in National Road Safety Week, the item on this week's report, item A before us, is one of the most significant safety projects Council has in the pipeline, the Indrapilly Roundabout Upgrade. 
Uh, this project has been develop in development for several years now and we've taken some important steps to get it to where it is today with shovels to be in the ground next year. In 2015, Council acquired the land within the Roundabout Island where the Audi dealership currently is in preparation for the intersection upgrade. Last year, concept design and analysis was completed and we released two concept design options to the community in September. The response from the community was loud and clear, we should build an overpass and that's what we're getting ready to do. This year, the project team has been finalising the business case, which was released last month on Council's website. This is one of the scariest, in my opinion, scariest intersection in the whole of the city, and it needs some serious work. Uh, the business case highlighted its high crash history, congestion issues, and lack of active travel infrastructure. At the beginning of the options development process, over 20 potential solutions were analysed before arriving at the final option uh, and assisted by the community in choosing that outcome. This year the project team has been progressing the preliminary design for this option which will feature an overpass that takes Coonan Street over Mogul Road, upgrades the existing Mogul Road service road to connect the overpass with Mogul Road, new shared pedestrian and cycle paths and on-road bike lines and bike lanes. And as part of the process uh, city, the CPO City Projects Office is also investigating further cycling options and a possible connection between the intersections, the Walter Taylor Bridge and the future Interpilly River Walk to provide enhanced, enhanced active travel routes through this busy part of the city. Uh, Mr Chair, during the preliminary design phase we've engaged the relevant public utility authorities to identify their needs and get ready for early works to kick off in September next year. We've also engaged three shortlisted tenderers who will participate in the early tender involvement process before the contract is awarded. We're fortunate to have attracted three very experienced contractors who are enthusiastic to begin workshops with Council this month. And through these workshops, they will contribute to the design refinement process and become more familiar with the construction requirements, which will help reduce construction risks. We're looking forward to finalising detail, detailed design early next year and then commencing construction later on in 2021. The project team has released a fly-through video on the project design on the Council's website. We showed that in committee last week, which shows quite clearly how the upgrade will transform this intersection and the various travel routes through it. I would encourage all councillors to have a look at the video, as I know residents from many different wards from all across the city traverse this intersection. Uh, and with that, uh, Mr Chair, I'll leave any debate to the Chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, I rise to speak on item A, the Indrapilly Roundabout Upgrade uh, Project. Uh, and can I say um, in the outset that uh, there are a number of aspects of this um, project that I am particularly concerned about and have been uh, since the initial consultation was put, up, put out. Um, so let me start with the following. Um, when you do read the business case, you understand that the 20 options that Councillor McLaughlin refers to are really only two or three different options um, with minor variations. So let's be clear, if anybody actually reads the document, um, it is very clear um, about uh, the number of very minor um, you know, variations. So um, the final option had about five different iterations, but it is essentially the same option. So, you know, I think there's, there's a bit of a problem and I encourage everyone to actually read the, um, the business case because it is uh, quite um, illuminating. And I just want to put on the record um, some details about my concerns uh, because um, whilst the project is important, uh, in my view, uh, the project uh, details and scope is, is certainly not optimum um, to ensure that all road users, um, cyclists and pedestrians, particularly those on the south side of the river that I represent, um, get a good deal out of this roundabout upgrade. Uh, so I do encourage everyone to read the business report. So 
whilst I'm strongly supportive of a flyover, and that's something I've been calling for since Council bought this land five years ago, uh, this is a hybrid model that still functions as a T intersection for city bound traffic using Mogul Road in the morning. We all want better and safer roads, public and active transport options, and there are some good aspects to this project. But the long term benefits seem very minor. They do not include travel time savings per se, but an estimated small reduction in the waiting times in 20. 31. So when you read the business case, the travel time savings referred to are actually based on people waiting a bit less in 2031, not less than now, less than what they expect it to be in 2031. Uh, the report does not include a detailed design, um, but it is clear the project was conceived without any detailed consideration of traffic requirements of residents on the south side of the Walter Taylor Bridge. Allwood Street is the limit of the project in a southerly direction, and no details on any traffic modelling or impacts to this intersection are included in the business case. It is also clear that the preferred option was only determined very late in the project development um, and that several other viable options were ignored. I remain extremely concerned about the following aspects of the project. The stated aim of the project is to prioritise east-west traffic on Mogul Road, uh, which has potential adverse impacts for Coonan Street, particularly in the AM peak, and that's on page 51. There is clearly, clearly stated in this document further possible high-rise development on the unused land around the new intersection, and that's stated on page 22. The lack of upgrades between Allwood Street and the bridge and additional turning pressure on the congested McDonald's intersection um, is massively underestimated, and that's at page 55. The lack of safe, dedicated off-road cycling facilities along Coonan Street, which is a principal cycling route um, and it's still underdone um, and ignored in this current plan. The extremely poor and unsafe access to shopping town across Mogul Road and Stanford Road, and I'll say this, um, this actually isn't in my um, area, um, but uh, I don't think you'll see the local councillor speaking up for you over there. And when Indrapilly residents find out what they're going to be made to do to cross Mogul Road to get to shopping town, they will go off their heads. There's now going to be an offset intersection crossing the median strip on Mogul Road. You then need to cross to the median strip in the middle of Stanford Road, and then you need to cross from the median strip in the middle of Stanford Road back across to the Indrapilly side. Um, it is shocking what Council has proposed there for pedestrian access for Indrapilly residents, and uh, I suspect they'll hear nothing from their own local, uh, their own local councillor about um, what's proposed here. It is an extremely poor and unsafe arrangement for those um, pedestrians and cyclists who need to cross Mogul Road. There are no detail about the resumptions or resumption costs. Uh, there is a significant lack of details around the merge arrangements for Coonan Street staff traffic on Mogul Road. This is an issue that I've raised in my written submissions, in verbal meetings with the project officers. Um, there is no detail on how the merge is going to be operated and uh, uh, it is hugely problematic because Mogul Road traffic will have right of way. Uh, the project has a very low cost uh, benefit uh, ratio of 2.08 and other options were even lower. Um, it's really clear why Council did this. Um, they, they could not stack this up. They could not stack this up and I look, you know, four is the standard as I understand it now. Um, so two um, was Council's old standard for, uh, for uh, these things. Um, but some of the options Council was considering um, early on were less than one. Um, so Council's had to fiddle this to get it over the line to get the state government funding, uh, federal government funding. So that's, that's what's happened here. Uh, 
The uh, extremely poor consultation summary at attachment C, it's a page and a bit. Um, it is extremely light on detail. I know my residents went uh, along to these um, meetings. Uh, their views are barely represented in this um, summary of uh, resident feedback. Um, and again, that's at page 78, and I encourage everyone to read it. They'll be shocked at how Council has treated um, the feedback of residents. The report also says that Council is estimating construction costs at $126 million, which seems delusional to me, um, and that the project is due to be built between 2021 and 2024. Um, I remain concerned um, that this project will not deliver um, the necessary improvements for residents who live on the south side of the river. Um, sadly, again, and the local councillor won't say anything about this, but fig tree pocket residents will be done over in the same way as my residents and also residents um, from the southern part of Indrapilly, all of whom rely on Coonan Street um, for local traffic movements. Um, and uh, it is, you know, Fig Tree Pocket wasn't even included in the consultation process. So a suburb that the only way, um, easy way for them to, uh, to get to Mogul Road, if they don't go all the way around via the Centenary Motorway, is via Coonan Street. They didn't even get the consultation flyer. Um, so there are some real problems with this. Um, I remain extremely concerned about what Council is proposing. Um, certainly um, at this stage there are a lot of unanswered questions about the design um, and I certainly want to see the detailed design. Um, but this is a lost opportunity in my view to fix the Coonan Street corridor properly. Um, stopping at Allwood Street and putting more pressure on an already congested intersection um, that is, um, you know, constricted by a low rail bridge, which is one of the crash hotspots in the network, does not seem like a sensible solution. Um, funneling more traffic in there, uh, which is what this plan will do, forces more traffic, um, you know, to go up Clarence Road to get to local services at the shops. I don't believe these aspects of the project have been well thought out. Um, and, uh, you know, Council's going to spend a lot of money doing this, cause a massive amount of disruption. Um, I do fear it will be another Kingsmith Drive. And there are aspects of this project that are not right in their current form. And I urge Council to fix them. Further speakers? Councillor Mackay. Yeah, thanks, Jared. I rose to speak about the infertility. Uh, Councillor Mackay, could you just push your microphone on again, please? No, no, that's all right. Go. There you go. I rose to speak about the Indrapilly Roundabout Mogul Road Coonan Street intersection upgrade. Well, what a mess the Indrapilly Roundabout is. I've me Please stop bullying me. I have mentioned previously in this place that a good friend of mine was involved in a serious crash at the site some years ago. He was one of many involved in a crash. Because this intersection has a high crash history with more than 40 crashes since 2012 and many hospitalizations. This is not a pleasant place to drive. It's congested, it's clogged, it's confusing, and it is dangerous. Modeling has shown that this intersection was at capacity in 2018, and from now until 2031, congestion will worsen, especially in the PM. Chair, in late 2019, Council sought feedback on two concept design options to significantly improve safety at this intersection. As a concerned local councillor, I turned up to the consultation sessions. I was the only councillor to do that. And we saw web traffic, mail and in-person consultation conducted to understand what people were most concerned about. It must be my comedy. Council met with the local community and key stakeholders and we received overwhelming support to upgrade the intersection. Further, I have had numerous one-on-one -on -one meetings with cycle groups and residents who had questions and ideas for improvements for this upgrade. And I'm really happy to say that terrific improvements have been made for cycling and for pedestrian access at this site. 
I'm sure too, Chair, that you'd be pleased, as I am, to know that the business case has been released. And as councillor for Walter Taylor Ward, I speak on behalf of my constituents in the local community when I say they are looking forward to huge benefits of a safety upgrade and an east-west passage that doesn't stop with traffic lights to get to Chapel Hill, Victory Pocket and other western suburbs. Key drivers for progressing the upgrade include the fact the roundabout experiences significant congestion. It's a multimodal route, pedestrians, cycling, cars, freight, buses. In fact, there are 29 bus routes travelling through the intersection. However, most importantly, the road safety audit indicated a high number of safety issues. Back in 2015, Brisbane City Council's feasibility, feasibility study report in, uh, concluded that the ultimate form of the Mogul Road intersection should be upgraded to a signalised T intersection. We've done that and we have an overpass. The business case cited a number of benefits that the upgrade would bring and I'll just quickly run you through them. It's going to improve safety by grade separation of Mogul Road and Coonan Street intersection. It's going to reduce delays and congestion at the Mogul Road and Coonan Street intersection for general traffic and for buses. It's going to enhance the ability for Mogul Road and Coonan Street to fulfil their roles as key arterial roads in the West Brisbane network through reduced travel times and crashes. Create an opportunity to provide a distinctive entry to the Indrapilly precinct in the unused intersection green space. It's going to provide better pedestrian accessibility to public and active transport options. It's going to minimise impacts on private residential and uh, commercial property. It's going to minimise impacts on the broader transport network in the area. Provide development opportunities for unused spaces around the intersection. It's going to provide cycle facilities. Provide a new pedestrian crossing facility across Muggle Road, which is on the Coonan Street overpass. That is a lot of benefits that I have just read from the business case. So finally, I'll talk about the work done for a key mode of transport, that of the pedestrian. I was pleased to see the feedback from people who wanted better pedestrian and cycle access. In fact, there were several issues identified in the road safety audit related to pedestrian movements at that intersection. And the key issue identified was the absence of adequate facilities to accommodate pedestrian desire lines between residential catchments and the local shopping centres. Currently, pedestrians cross at mid-block locations where they use splitter islands and medians as refuge points. And having done that numerous times, I'm not a big fan of crossing Mogul Road at splitter islands. I'm pleased we have reached the point of the business case. It makes for interesting, albeit complex reading. I look forward to seeing this intersection upgrade proceed, and I hope all in this place support its progression. Further speakers? Uh, Councillor Adaman. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I rise to speak briefly about item A, uh, Council's plan to undertake a major upgrade at the Intrapilly roundabout. Uh, although in the neighbouring Walter Taylor Ward, residents in my ward of Pullenvale stand to benefit considerably from this project. Anyone who travels regularly on busy Mogul Road knows the frustrations at this intersection, resulting in constant delays for all road users. Not only will this upgrade uh, help ease congestion on Mogul Road, it will see the introduction of a number of safety improvements with motorists no longer having to take their chances at this dangerous intersection. Uh, Mr Chair, as Councillor McLaughlin has pointed out, this intersection has a high crash history with more than 40 recorded incidents leading to hospitalisation and medical treatment in recent years. Congestion on Mogul Road continues to be the single biggest issue raised with me since being elected. Although it is state-owned and operated, a three-tiered government approach is necessary to help ease congestion on Mogul Road and this administration is to be commended for playing its part with this upgrade. Mr Chair, uh, these works at Indrapilly are on the Mogul Road corridor which links with the Kenmore roundabout in the Pullenvale Ward. I congratulate my federal uh, colleagues, uh, a federal colleague, the member for Ryan, Julian Simmons, and uh, state colleague, the member for Mogul, Dr Christian Rowan, for securing a combined $25 million to help fix this problem. 
Uh, with the state election now out of the way, I look forward to the reappointed Minister for Transport undertaking a public and stakeholder consultation as a matter of urgency to determine how this upgrade will look so that uh, work can commence there as soon as possible. And in doing so, uh, residents will see that we are making a meaningful contribution to reducing traffic congestion and improving traffic safety in the western suburbs. Thank you. Further speakers? Anyone at all? Councillor McLaughlin. We'll now put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, please. Thanks, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 10th of November 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Cunningham, seconded by Councillor Landers. The report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 10th of November 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Cunningham. Mr Chair, before I get to the committee report, in the council meeting on the 10th of September 2019, Councillor Shri asked that the petition for the formal naming of the park, currently known as Wellington Road Park, located at 5 Wellington Road, East Brisbane, to what park lie on the table for further consultation to be undertaken? So, Mr Chair, I move that Clause B of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee report of the 3rd of September 2019, park naming, formal naming of the park currently known as Wellington Road Park, 5 Wellington Road, East Brisbane, to what park be taken off the table? Seconded. I have a resolution to take, a, to take a, an existing item that has been put on the table at the meeting noted. Uh, uh, it's been moved by Councillor Cunningham, seconded by Councillor Landers. All those in favour of taking this item off the table, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Uh, Councillor Cunningham, as you've already spoken in that debate, I will now call on people. We will now recommence that item at the point where we left it. Are there any further speakers on the matter of the formal naming of what park? Yes. Uh, Councillor Adams, you already spoke. All right. Oh, I already spoke on that I will petition. I wouldn't I won't oh, it's, it's like guess who. I'll tell you who's already here. Councillor Hammond, Councillor Cunningham, Councillor Griffiths, Councillor Johnston, Councillor Adams and Councillor Shree have already spoken. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Uh, uh, anyone? Councillor Owen? Yes, Councillor Owen. Thank, thank you, Mr Chairman. Sorry, it's just a little bit more so difficult that's with, all right. with now, the hot desking. Councillor, I'm just giving you one moment. Um, councillors, that item has now been distributed to all councillors for review. We appreciate that not everyone might recall the specifics of that resolution, but it is now in your entries. Councillor Owen, 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, just in relation to this matter, when it did go off the table, um, it was um, previously in one ward and now it's moved to another, so I understand it's moved from the Gabba ward into the Cooparoo ward. Um, I understand that Councillor Cunningham has undertaken further consultation with residents, including with the proponent, Mr Barry Watt. Um, as the local councillor, I know that Councillor Cunningham is um, certainly supporting, supportive of this naming and uh, that is proposed within this petition. And she also um, has uh, discovered that a former councillor um, in this place, Helen Abrahams, was also very, very supportive of this idea. In fact, this proposal has been in discussion since before 2013. So now is an appropriate time that we just move on um, and ensure this matter is finalised. So uh, the Watt family has had an extensive association with East Brisbane, dating back to 1923, nearly 100 years. In fact, the Watt family are still operating Watts Bus and Coach Works in Lotus Street, just adjacent to this small park. So, Mr Chair, I think um, on behalf of the family and the local community, it's important that we support this and I commend this motion to the Chamber. Further speakers? There being no further speakers, the right reply, Councillor Hammond? No? All right, I'll now put the resolution for the naming of Watt Park. All those in favour of the naming of Watt Park, please say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, we will now return to the substantive 
report. Thanks, Mr Chair. Returning to the committee report, our presentation related to our announcement of the upgrade to Bonsai House at the Brisbane Botanic Gardens at Mount Cutha. Situated next to the Japanese Garden in the Brisbane Botanic Gardens, the Bonsai House currently has 51 bonsai plants on public display, with 30 plants in training. Interestingly, 70% of this collection are, are natives and species include figs, conifers, camellias, azaleas and maples. Botanic Garden staff and volunteers from the Bonsai Society of Queensland and Beamer Bonsai Club help to look after and train the bonsai by directing the growth of a plant by bending, pruning and tying them back. Brisbane's Bonsai House is a popular destination for tourists and school children with volunteers regularly holding workshops, talks and bonsai sketching in the community. The new design is inspired by bonsai houses and botanic gardens around the world, including Japan, North America and Australia. The current plant nursery will remain as it is and we will build a new entrance courtyard, workshop, bonsai display pavilion and contemplation platform. Construction of the new bonsai house will commence next Next year and will be open to the public in 2022. Mr Chair, we also had two petitions on the agenda, a petition requesting Council enforce the hours of operation of the half basketball court located within West End Riverside Lands Park at West End, and a petition requesting Council allocate land to be used for the creation of mountain bike features for use by the Fig Tree Pocket community. I'll leave the rest to the Chamber. Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I um, rise to speak briefly on the presentation about uh, the Bonsai House. And there you have it, Brisbane. Uh, the priorities of this Lord Mayor and this administration on show for everyone. They would rather spend $2.6 million on building a house for some tiny plants uh, instead of providing basic services like curbside collection. What a terrible shame for this city. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Just really quickly on the bonsais, I'd like to know whether these trees will be counted towards the number of trees <laughs> that Council boasts about planting each year. Obviously, they don't, I don't think they're planting enough trees around the city, and I, I would be cautious about the possibility of Council using this as a sneaky way of upping their count on tree planting. Further speakers? There being none, Councillor Cunningham. Thanks, Mr Chair. Look, um, since May, we've heard nothing from the opposition about single, a single job creating infrastructure project they didn't want to scrap to divert to curbside collection. So, look, really what Brisbane needs at this time is an administration that's focused on delivering infrastructure and jobs for Brisbane. And um, I commend this project and investment at Bonsai House. Thank you. I'll now, I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. And those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, City Standards and Community Health and Safety Committee, please. Councillor Marks. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 10th of November 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Marks, seconded by Councillor Landers. The report of the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 10th of November 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Marks. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. We had uh, just one uh, committee presentation last week um, on public place waste infrastructure. And as we all know, Council loves their acronyms and the Council officer said they call it the PPW, which caused a huge amount of um, laughter amongst the community. So he, he thereon refused to re re refer to it in the, with that acronym anymore. <laughs> so anyway, it was a bit of fun at the time. Um, and. <laughs> We didn't. We, we deal with the big things here, um, and but we didn't have any petitions or any GB or anything like that. So it was just all on the infrastructure. So I found it interesting. So I'll leave the rest as a debate to the chamber. Further speakers, Councillor Johnston. Yes, just briefly, it was um, a very interesting uh, petition, as waste um, petitions usually are, having been on this committee for some period of time. Um, what we did find out was there has been a bit of a bias towards the north side um, with the uh, replacement of um, uh, bins, um, and it is disappointing. There are, uh, as we now know, there is a policy in place that we can have the skillion bins in district access parks. Um, and uh, certainly um, there are, I don't, 
most of my parks don't have them. They've just got a usual kind of um, wheelie bin with one of those little uh, hood things on it to stop you lifting the lid right up. And we don't have recycling in many places. Um, there is also a problem with council removing bins from bus stops. Um, uh, despite Councillor Mark's assurance this morning in committee to a question on notice, I can tell you that bins are being lost from bus stops all over Brisbane. Yes, um, there are disability access upgrades happening, um, but we should be having bins at bus stops. It's just it should be part of the standard. Um, it should be part of the standard process uh, for if you take a bin out, you put a bin back in. Um, so I, I just. I, th I just think there's a little bit of a problem with what's happening um, with this. Obviously, recycling is really uh, an important issue in Brisbane for residents, um, but there is a lack of consistency, I think, in how um, you know waste matters are being addressed. And um, you know, when when some parts of the city get Rolls Royce treatment, including I must say, Councillor Shree's area, as we heard this morning, 22 new bins went into um, Kangaroo Point. Um, but, you know, we've got bins that are probably 30 years old in other parts of the city um, when probably not, um, you know, uh, investing fairly right across the city. So um, I think it is really important that we see an, an equitable standard, that we see fairness across uh, the north side, north side and south side. Um, and uh, certainly I think that um, we should be putting more recycling bins in, we should be upgrading bins all over the city uh, to make it easier for residents to do the right thing and to help keep our suburbs clean. We know that's what they want. I've been contacted by so many residents about um, the changes to um, the way in which uh, tip vouchers have been given out and council must have dozens and dozens of complaints about this because I know what my office has put in. Um, we have uh, been contacted by numerous residents about the loss of curbside collection and the um, western part of my ward was um, that they're one of the areas in Brisbane that will have three years without a curbside collection. Uh, you know, so I think that, um, you know, to coin a phrase on the last issue, if we can find $2.6 billion a million dollars for some bonsai trees, we should be able to be putting bins in and picking up the rubbish off the side of the street around Brisbane. Further speakers? Councillor Marks. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I believe the uh, Infrastructure Councillor Johnson, through you, Mr Chair speaking, um, was referring to as the Guardian Pole, which is the flippy thing that stops the bins opening up. Um, and um, also on that note, I, did, Councillor Johnson, through you, Mr Chair, did ask uh, or did mention that he, she had put in or her ward office had put in a number of requests for recycling bins. Um, I have asked her to resend those requests through to me um, so I can um, ascertain what happened to those requests. Um, I haven't got that email yet. I'm guessing her office is still working on that. So, um, as I said, a request for those, send them through to the office and we will get the officers to look at them. Thank you. I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 10th of November 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Howard, seconded by Councillor Landers. The report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 10th of November 2020, be adopted. Is there a debate? Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. And uh, before I just move to my report, um, I would like to say that the nighttime economy is doing very well, Mr Chair. Through you, I'd like to say that um, whether it's joining the Lord Mayor and Councillor Cassidy at the opening of the Fortitude Music Hall some time ago to see my favourite band, DZ Death Rays. I just needed to get that in <laughs> yet again because, of course, they will be performing at the Valley Fiesta. So, and when you see them, tell them I said hello. Um, but can I say that we, we've had a, a great time. On Friday night, I joined Councillor Shree at uh, Backbone to see Absolute Objectivity, uh, a play by Jeremy Neal and Samson Smith, and it was absolutely fantastic. Um, my favourite tune was It's a Socialist Christmas, and it was a musical about rigged elections, so it really had something for everyone, I thought, on the night. 
Um, so that was on Friday night. Um, Saturday night, I was off to Shakespeare. So, you know, there is diversity within our city. And again, a fantastic event at the Roman Street Parklands of a Midsummer Night's Dream. It's the 13th year of the Shakespeare Festival and it's absolutely fantastic. I think it's at your, at, so I'm bumping this weekend, Councillor Cassidy, and also uh, Councillor McLaughlin, you might want to pop along to Newstead, but um, it is such a great performance and so I can thoroughly recommend that. On Sunday, I popped into Act for Kids and helped them to launch One Less Present. So I did promise them that I would tell all of my colleagues here that instead of doing your secret Santa, let's get behind Act for Kids and have One Less Present, a One Less Present gift card. It means that it's going to a great cause and it was um, fantastic to, to launch that up at the reservoir up at Spring Hill with the Underground Opera Company who had um, who who performed their own little song about it and said Nan's getting nothing, which was sort of a bit sad, but anyway, um, that was great. Oh, so that was on um, that was Sunday, and then Sunday afternoon we had the seniors gala concert, the Lord Mayor's senior cabaret gala, and the Lord Mayor introduced it. Um, we had a great time. I, I know that Councillor Landers and Councillor Hutton and Councillor Atwood and Councillor Davis all, all joined us. Um, I took my dad along and I have to say that Councillor Davis's mother nearly sort of ran away with him. He is 90 and he does have a girlfriend, so I'm just giving, putting her on notice that, you know, that's not going to happen. <laughs> So Councillor Davis did have to sort of take her mother away and take back to her husband. So that was a, a it was a, but it was a, again another fantastic event that uh, that we had. And um, it would be remiss of me not to mention um, the Wynnum Fringe Festival. And I know that Councillor Cumming has been very supportive of this, as, as has Brisbane City Council. Tom Oliver has done the most amazing job um, of activating Wynnum. Uh, it's, I've been watching it on Facebook and there's just been some fantastic posts. And uh, through you, Mr. Mr Acting Chair, I'd like to say to, um, uh, to Councillor Adams that uh, one of the things that really sort of worked was using some of the empty shop fronts. So um, I really want to thank her area for helping Tom with that. He came to see me quite late in the piece, uh, thanks to Councillor coming, referring him to us. We were able to help him with some funding, um, but more importantly, we put him in touch with other areas of council that were also able to, to help. So um, I think that, uh, you know, that was my weekend, so it was a pretty busy one, but um, lots of fun. And I do really encourage everyone to sort of get behind the things that are happening in your local community. It is so important for us to, su to support these small businesses. And uh, it was fantastic to see people again getting out and enjoying um, the weekend. Um, moving to the report, uh, we were still sort of keeping with the nighttime um, economy theme in that we talked about the Sir, T Sir Thomas Brisbane Planetarium. And uh, Councillor Toomey ta gave us a, a great story about uh, taking his now wife of 21 years on her second date to the planetarium where he fell asleep. But he's still happily married and it was, uh, it, was a great, it was a great presentation. And I know that my fellow committee members that are here really enjoyed um, that presentation. And can I thank everybody that was involved um, with that presentation. And, and particularly, it's, it's just so fantastic to see our officers enjoying what they, what they do. And uh, our city venues manager really gave us um, a great insight into some of the history of, of the Sir Thomas of Brisbane Planetarium. We also had um, uh, Mark Rigby, who's the curator. And uh, Mark is just such an amazing human being. And, and again, everybody at the committee had a, had a great time sort of watching the video and, uh, and hearing from Mark about some of the things that happened there. So I encourage you all to get along to the planetarium and I will recommend my report to the chamber. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Is there any further debate? No, anyone? I see no councillors standing. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. We now move on to... Give me one moment. Finance and Administration. Councillor Allen, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Finance, Administration and Small Business Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 10th of November 2020 be adopted.
Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Landers, that the report of the Finance and Administration and Small Business Committee dated Tuesday the 10th of November 2020 be adopted. Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. At uh, last week's committee meeting, we had a uh, presentation on foreign exchange hedging, and uh, this is obviously a uh, mechanism that's used by a lot of organisations to manage foreign exchange risk. Uh, and in particular, the uh, presentation outlined Council's approach, which uh, includes referencing Council's financial risk management framework. We also work with our bankers to, uh, to, to structure the uh, transaction, and then we uh, also get oversight from QTC, who um, provide their view on uh, any structuring that's done. And then ultimately, uh, these hedges are approved by the state government under the Statutory Bodies Financial Arrangements Act. So it's a fair, fairly thorough process of uh, oversight and, uh, and approval. Um, in addition to the presentation, we had a a regular report, the Bank and Investment Report for September 2020, and I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Is there any further debate? Being no councillors rising, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? The ayes have it. Point of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order. Uh, Deputy Chairman. Point of order, Councillor Johnson. Uh, I move that the motion be taken off the table that was tabled on the 25th of the 8th, 20, uh, that Brisbane City Council initiates amendments to City Plan 2014 to remove provisions that allow rooming accommodation and boarding houses within the low density and character residential zones of City Plan 2014. Seconded. It, uh, do you have the length of that all in writing for me? Or? It, it was provided in writing to Council, but I do have my copy oh, here. thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, Billy. Mm -hmm. uh, councillors, it has been moved by Councillor Johnson and seconded by Councillor Griffith uh, that the Brisbane City Council uh, moved that the Brisbane City Council initiated amendments of City Plan 2014 to remove the provisions that allow rooming accommodation and boarding houses within the low density and character residential zone of City Plan 2014 be taken off the table. So. All right, yeah. uh, sorry, would you speak to the amendment, please? It's a, okay, all right then, my apologies. Uh, can we have a vote, please? All those in favour say aye. Aye. And all those against? No. no. The noes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnson and Councillor Shree. Can you ring the bells, please? Procedural motion. Deputy Chair, the uh, nays have the voting being six in favour and 19 against. Uh, the motion is lost. We will now move on to petitions. Councillors, are there any petitions? Uh, Acting Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. I have a petition on traffic control on Crew Street in Mount Cravat East. Councillor Hutton. I've got a petition requesting fencing around a basketball court at Juicy Street Park, Tara. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. 
Uh, thanks, Acting Chair. I have two petitions. One uh, requesting Council reverse the decision to permanently, permanently close the Norman Park Ferry Service and all efforts made to reinstate that service. Uh, and another petition on behalf of over 400 casual bus drivers in Brisbane uh, calling uh, on them to receive the concessional days that they are being denied. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Can I have a motion to accept the petition, please? Mr Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Griffith, that all petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. All those in favour? Say aye. aye. Against? No, the ayes have it. Councillors, general business. Are there any statements required as a result of the Officer of Independent Assessor or Councillor Ethics Committee order? There being no councillors standing, general business. Acting Mayor. Thank you, um, Mr Deputy. Uh, Chair, I just want to speak briefly about the motion to remove that petition off the table about rooming accommodation. We made it very clear when we lay it on the table that it was premature, considering that we were uh, starting the housing strategy and that draft would be out early in the year. It is too soon to say yes, no, maybe or anything in between for rooming accommodation. Uh, within low density, we need to look at housing options and that will be done through the housing strategy when we will then look at that petition response. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Further speakers? Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Chair. Um, I rise to speak on, a, on about three things tonight. Um, the first, uh, and uh, the first is uh, Casmer Way Park community consultation. Um, one of the greatest pleasures I, I think any council would have is to help develop a new, well, blank canvas, a park that actually has nothing on it or in it other than grass and, and some trees. And Cashmore, uh, Cashmore Park is one of these now. Um, most people don't even know it's actually there because it's uh, on the deviation, the uh, Progress Road deviation um, uh, northbound um, towards uh, Wakehall. And um, it's up on a rise, uh, a, a, I call it a plateau. And, uh, and uh, I think probably my second year uh, as, uh, as councillor for the area, I was driving past uh, with uh, one of my team and I said, uh, I wonder what's up there? And, uh, and so we, uh, we pulled over down Orchard Road and, and uh, tried to make us, uh, tried to find, we climbed the bankment just to have a look. And there was this big open field. And I'm thinking, I wonder who the heck owns this? Because a lot of the other land along Progress Road, of course, is is privately owned, and I thought, oh, well, there'll be more townhouses, I suppose, built up here, but it would have really nice elevation. Um, so uh, anyway, so we went back to the office and checked it out, and it is Brisbane City Council alone. I thought, oh, oh ripper, uh, because uh, this is a space where those people who do live in the townhouses next door and the other townhouse developments, which will probably happen as well uh, in years to come, uh, they really don't actually have any uh, place for the kids to play. And, uh, and certainly uh, there's nothing in walking distance anyways, safe walking distance, because Progress Road is a very busy road. So um, we started that, uh, that uh, conversation with the council officers just to see what was going to happen with this space. And, uh, uh, and uh, we're now up to the consultation uh, period where uh, we did some initial consultation. We sent out some surveys and things like that for the residents around. And, um, and uh, we got really good positive feedback because they're all keen to, uh, to have some equipment in this park. Um, it's, um, it's a park that uh, will uh, eventually be uh, probably almost a district level type of um, space. It won't probably be called a district park, but it's certainly big enough to be one. And, um, but we're going to start off with uh, the consultations this coming uh, Sunday, one-on-one uh, -on -one, face to face with council officers and myself and, and some of my team. And, um, we'll uh, start uh, looking at uh, what the uh, residents want. So I thought I'd just mention that. Um, as I say, it doesn't happen very often where you just get this blank canvas that you can uh, do something with. Um, the second item is uh, in regards to the uh, lantern uh, picnic that uh, happened on Saturday. Um, and uh, this was uh, undertaken uh, by the uh, three, three, three uh, groups in my community. 
um, the uh, hub community projects, Anala Youth Service, and uh, in Multicultural Australia. And, uh, and there's a few more that we're supporting it as well. It's, uh, it's, it's, a lantern, um, it's a lantern festival, I suppose uh, you would call it. Um, and uh, they play local culture music and, uh, and they make these quite imaginative lamps, uh, uh, lanterns, I should say. And, um, and uh, there was probably around about 100, uh, 100 uh, lanterns uh, made and uh, released. And um, the local Lions Club, of course, helped with the food, as they always do in the Anala area, uh, our Anala, uh, wonderful Anala Lions Club. Um, and they um, very culturally sensitive about, about the, the sausages, of course, because they did have some halal sausages as well as normal beef uh, sausages as well. But I'd just like to congratulate um, the, uh, the groups that took that on board, uh, COVID sensitive and, uh, and safe, and uh, which is, Again, uh, just nice to see that there's some of these uh, activities that are now starting to happen uh, in the ward. Uh, lastly, um, it, the Indigenous uh, Health Service have been uh, running a hippie program, which I'll tell you what that is in a minute, um, uh, for the last 11 years. All right? uh, this is the uh, hippie stands for Home Interaction Program Parents and Youngsters. Um, and it's, it's a home-based um, parenting and early childhood program for families and children aged four. So obviously preschool. Um, as I say, it's been happening for 11 years and it was pioneered by the Indigenous uh, Health Service and Milton Dick, uh, the former councillor for the area who, uh, who supported it for uh, the eight years he was councillor and I have supported it um, after that as well. So it's, it's a really great program which actually just gives us kids the opportunity to be uh, school ready, if I can put it that way, um, especially the readings. But it's just not about learning to read early in life. It's also about having to, uh, how to play games and um, how to really enjoy that interaction that, uh, that sometimes, is, um, sometimes isn't uh, happening with, uh, between kids uh, and, and, their, and their parents. Because, uh, you know, parents nowadays are pretty uh, uh, time poor. And um, so it's just a little bit of help that the Indigenous Health Service puts together uh, to make uh, to, to get those kids up to speed when they uh, go off to, uh, to to preschool. So I'll just finish my comments here, Mr. Deputy Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Further speakers, Councillor Mackay. Thank you, uh, Chair. I rise to give a, a two-minute Tuesday report on some activities in Walter Taylor Ward. First of all, I'll start by telling you that the Carinya Street traffic calming consultation is progressing. This is a, a very exciting little project for that area called Indrapilly Woods. They're getting a park upgrade and a public toilet, so the traffic calming is very welcomed. Thanks to Jennifer in that uh, community group. Artspace Tawong held their Christmas market on Sunday, which was excellent, and unfortunately I emptied my pocket of all my money buying fantastic art. So um, that, that'll be up and around for Christmas presents, family. Thanks to Cathy and Ruby for that. Archer Street Glen Road public meeting was good. We were talking about some new developments that were going on and they reiterate, reiterated our council's position um, not to turn student accommodation into rooming accommodation. Channel 9 ran a story about the tree poisoning in Indrapilly. Unfortunately, we don't know which idiot is drilling holes in trees and pouring poison into them. Um, they do have him on CCTV, so hopefully they get to identify him pretty soon. The Mandalay Progress Association was held on Sunday night, and congratulations to Joseph and the incoming executive. I know that advocacy group does a lot of work for uh, Mandalay and Fig Tree Pocket, and I will look forward to working closely with them uh, with their future vision for Fig Tree Pocket. Of course, it was Remembrance Day through last week, and I was honoured to lay two wreaths made by the students of Indrapilly State School. They created a red one for service by humans and a purple one to acknowledge the service animals. Uh, so well done and thank you to Indrapilly State School. Where is the giant xylophone going, Chair, I heard you ask. Well, we're going to put it in at Regatta, and it's going to be a, an oversized xylophone piece of public art so people waiting for the city cat or um, doing their morning run can enjoy a bit of a, a 
play in the ivories, I guess you call it. <laughs> However, you, whatever the verb, a tingle on the xylophone. Um, the community gardens progress in Turinga and St Lucia. Turinga got their sh uh, modified shipping container, which is fantastic, and the St Lucia crew is putting a storage container together, and they now have planter beds, which is very exciting, so they'll have some uh, crops uh, growing very soon. Finally, West Tawong Bowls. We had a meeting down there to discuss their grant for a solar. They spend $12,000 a year on electricity, which is a lot of money for a small community club. They're getting solar all over their roof and they look forward to having a break-even point in two years. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Further speakers. Councillor Johnson. Yes, I rise to speak on two matters, uh, rooming accommodation and uh, consent orders in the Planning and Environment Court. Um, firstly, with respect to rooming accommodation. Um, uh, as the Council knows, in um, August I moved a motion calling on rooming accommodation uh, to be uh, removed from the low density zoning area of Council. In my ward, in the suburbs of Yoronga, Yorong Pili, Tennyson and Fairfield, um, we have de facto units creeping into low density areas. Um, it is a significant problem and we just heard uh, Councillor Mackay refer to a version of it in his own ward. Um, now this council went out to bat in his ward to stop student accommodation being turned into rooming accommodation. Um, Councillor Adams didn't actually stand up and say, oh, we can't really address this petition now because there's a housing um, plan being developed. They fought hard to stop it um, because it was politically in their interest to do so. Um, meanwhile, in my area, in Councillor Griffith's area, we are seeing de facto units springing up in low density area without approval. Council's um, investigations team do not have the powers to stop them during building when clearly my residents are reporting to Council uh, that they are being built as units. They look like units. They're all self-contained. They've all got their own kitchens. They've all got their own bathrooms and lounge rooms. Um, and uh, Council officers can't even get in to these buildings unless they're invited in. There is an immediate problem that needs to be addressed and Councillor Adams is blocking discussion of that matter in this forum for political purposes, and that is unacceptable. Contrast that with what is happening now in a marginal LNP ward, where she bends over backwards to facilitate an outcome uh, to assist in that ward. So there is a clear problem with Councillor Adams' excuses here again tonight about why she and the LNP are blocking this. If there's a housing plan being developed, um, great, OK. Um, but why is Councillor uh, Mackay's area getting preferential treatment? Um, because clearly um, it's not about any kind of housing plan. It's about protecting their own areas and ignoring serious policy issues um, that are outside of LNP wards. Consent orders. Now, um, earlier tonight I was warned a couple of times uh, about interjecting. Um, but I honestly cannot believe um, some of the things that were said by Councillor Adams uh, about the situation with appeals. Now, I say this in the sense that I have been involved in two um, P&E appeals uh, as a respondent, and I have worked with residents on several others. So I am familiar with the process and have participated in the process. Councillor Adams has made a number of statements today that just demonstrate that she has a significant lack of understanding about how the appeals process works. Um, and that is concerning given she is both the planning chairperson responsible for this area and the deputy mayor today and next week apparently acting mayor of the city of Brisbane. Consent orders are, occur where the court signs off on an outcome that is negotiated by the parties. Um, it is not an imposed decision by the court on a DA appeal. It is, for all intents and purposes, without being disrespectful to the court, a rubber stamp. Now, Councillor Adams also made a number of other statements today um, that... Uh, uh, that um, 
essentially about mediation. I'll just I'll say about mediation because um, I, I don't want to quote her. Um, now, Councillor Adams implied um, that. Uh, you know, that they have to sort these things out in mediation, otherwise there's an adverse outcome. The problem with her statement is the court does not prescribe the type of mediation. They do not prescribe a particular outcome as part of mediation. They do not prescribe conditions or changes to the DA as part of mediation. Mediation is, again, a facilitation process that allows the developer and council and any other respondents to participate in um, a discussion without commitment. That is the most specific thing about mediation. It does not bind you to a particular outcome. Now, Councillor Adams has gone on to say that if mediation fails, then there's not much else they can do. Yes, there is, to every single person out there listening. You can go to court, ask for a trial, have a hearing, and this council could stand up and defend its decisions. And this is fundamentally the problem. I think if we had the statistics, which I know the questions have been put on notice on numerous occasions, and this administration refuses to answer them, um, you would find that so many of these cases, uh, 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 the outcome is done by consent, rather than there being a trial and a court decision. Now, that is the legacy of this administration. And it was shocking, shocking to watch last week. And poor Councillor Atwood, presumably she went and got advice from Councillor Adams because she publicly stated that the court had made a decision to overturn council's um, consent to the DA out at Tingalpa. The court took the step of writing to the paper to correct the record. Now, let's be clear. Consent orders reflect agreement between the developer and council. It is not a court-imposed outcome with respect to a development application. Councillor Adams um, seems to be unaware of this process. She's also unaware that the court does not mandate a particular outcome through mediation. That's obvious from what she was saying today. And what she fails to understand completely, completely, is that, yes, lawyers will give you their best advice about whether they think a trial may be successful or not. And having been through this on numerous occasions, I can tell you sometimes my lawyers might have said to me, oh, it's 50-50, and I'll say, great, let's give it a go because you have to put your best foot forward. What I note and what I have heard Liberal councillors in this place say time and time again is they are opposed to these um, DAs, but then when um, it gets to the appeal, they're happy to see council backflip. They should be fighting tooth and nail, fighting... Thank you, Council Atwood, for your interjection. Um, she's saying to me they do. Clearly, no, that's not happening. Join as a respondent. This is why I've done it twice, because council backflips in appeals over and over and over again. If you are a respondent, you are part of the process and you can fight it. But this council is taking decisions, which is the least cause of resistance. There's a lot of money at stake. I understand that. They are complex issues. I understand that. But where the community says we don't support a DA, where council says no to a DA, which is just rare as hen's tooth anyway, yes. but then to watch council backflip, backflip and wrongly blame the court when they are participating over and over and over in agreed outcomes that are not mandated by the court, that means that council is doing a backflip. They are folding. Uh, they're doing uh, what uh, there's so many other words I could use to describe it roll over It is just not acceptable to watch council then stand up as they've done in the last week or two and blame the court This is a responsibility of council to make sure that community expectations and our planning decisions are defended robustly through the court process. And we should be at all times making sure um, that we push 
uh, council to go to a hearing to seek an outcome because folding at the last minute because it's convenient or it's all too hard, which is what's going on here, I'm sorry to say, this didn't even get past mediation. Um, you know, if council's going to agree to things like this, it's just not acceptable. Um, so it is really disappointing to see uh, Councillor Adams um, standing up today to try and justify council's own behaviour and blame it on the um, Planning and Environment Court. It's not acceptable. And I know there'll be a lot of councillors, council officers out there listening. I say, if council has opposed a DA, defend it in court. I have unfortunately seen council roll over so many times in the appeals process in my area, and it is leading to poor outcomes in our community, marginal developments that are not supported. And whilst it is tough in the planning and environment court, our council needs to have Councilor the Johnson, courage of its convictions. Has expired. Further speakers, Councillor Atwood. Thank you, Deputy Chair. I'd just like to publicly thank a few champions in my ward. President Graham Mapri and senior coach um, Harsha De Silva from the Wynnum Manly Cricket Club. A few months ago, I heard about a little plan they were hatching to collect unused cricket goods and clothing from our community and donate it to children from Sri Lanka. I popped out to the club to thank them and to also grab a pick to help promote this awesome initiative they were running. Over the following week, my office was inundated with, de uh, with donations from local residents and other cricket clubs, including the Brisbane State High School's Cricket Club and Redlands Cricket Club. But the photo from Harsh's garage, when he was trying to sort through it, was the icing on the cake. It was literally filled to the brim. You couldn't move. Currently, the cricket gear is on its way to Sri Lanka, to a local charity, the Foundation of Goodness. I really can't wait to see the pictures of when the cricket gear arrives and when those smiling children from Sri Lanka are having their first cricket game. So once again, thank you to Harsha and Graham for this wonderful initiative and keep up the good work, boys. Thank you, Councillor. Further speakers? Councillor Cummings. Coming. Coming. That's good. Oh, now I'm throwing my phone away. Hold on. Sorry. Sorry, Mr Chairman. I was trying to keep counting. You're right, uh, Councillor. I'd, I'd like to speak on the uh, development issue too. Uh, I think uh, Councillor uh, Johnson has stolen some of my thunder, but I'm, uh, I've got a different, I've got, I've got a different view of the uh, behaviour of Councillor Atwood. Uh, I think uh, she portrays herself as a fresh young councillor, but I think she knows well what's going on here and the fact that uh, the. Uh, this application, uh, the council could have uh, fought the matter to a hearing, taken it to a hearing, waited to see what the court said. They might have won, they might have lost, uh, and but then it would have been uh, in concrete because the judge had made the decision. Having heard the uh, evidence from the parties, having heard the expert witnesses on both parties, but instead of that, the Brisbane City Council, as it often does in these types of cases, has gone and settled the matter, which they're perfectly entitled to do, but a settlement is. There's no, no uh, judgment whatsoever from the, uh, from the judge as to whether it's a correct decision, whether the conditions are good or bad or indifferent. It's an agreement between the Brisbane City Council and the developer to uh, come to a uh, compromise, perhaps you might say, and settle the matter. It's not, it's not gone to a hearing. And in this case, this, this uh, this application was a shocker in the first place. I'll just go through the grounds of refusal uh, given when, the, uh, when it was first refused. It said, uh, I'll just summarise some of the ones that were taken. There's 10 different grounds on which it was refused. It, one of them was, this site is significantly constrained by flood impacts of creek, waterway, river and coastal hazard origin. Creek, waterway, river and coastal hazard origin. The proposed development is unacceptable as it has been unable to demonstrate adequate resilience to flood and coastal hazard constraints which impact upon the site and imposes increased flooding impacts on surrounding properties. The, the development places unreasonable risk on the safety and well-being of people and property. Oh, well, that's, that's number one. Number two, on the issue of traffic access and infrastructure design. The proposed development is unacceptable as it has been unable to demonstrate safe, appropriate no. access arrangements. Number three, the proposed development is unacceptable as it has been unable to demonstrate an appropriate design commensurate with the waterway corridor on which it is located. 
noting that waterway corridors have a both a water conveyance, hydrological function and ecological function. The proposed development is unacceptable. It's been unable to demonstrate appropriate responsiveness to the high ecological significance of the site located along Balimba Creek and fails to enhance the ecological functionality of the site. The proposed development is unacceptable. It's been unable to demonstrate appropriate management of stormwater impacts. The proposed development is unacceptable. It's been unable to demonstrate safe, appropriate management of hazardous goods potentially stored on a site impacted by flooding and coastal hazards. The proposed development is unacceptable. It's been unable to demonstrate appropriate management of potential sources of air emissions and odour beyond the confines of the site. The proposed development is unacceptable as it has been unable to demonstrate appropriate management of acid sulphate soils. The proposed development is unacceptable as its built form and layout has not been designed to meet the requirements of the Special Purpose Code and likewise with landscaping. The proposed development is unacceptable. Its landscaping arrangements have not been designed to meet the requirements of the Special Purpose Code. So that's, you know, that's an absolute damnation of this as a development application. This is a shocker. This is a shocker that uh, Council were entirely, enti entirely appropriate in knocking it back. And, but of course there's a political overlay with this, is to, of course uh, we saw in the run up to the election the administration whenever there was a bit of controversy you might get some of their candidates in a bit of, in a bit of hot water. What were they doing to DAs? Knocking them back left, right and centre. And then what, what's happened after the election, the, the, the developers lodged an appeal at some stage, after the election, whoa, it's been approved, it's been approved. So this one, uh, it was knocked back in um, September 2019, six and, months, six and a half months before the election, and then uh, the, conditions, uh, the new conditions were accepted by the court, rubber stamped by the court, 26th of August 2020. Five months after the election, it's been approved. Well, well, well. And of course, that's happening all over the place. Uh, uh, we noticed during the election campaign the number of knockbacks had just rocketed up. And of course, uh, the vast bulk of them after the election, they've been approved. Uh, the council's done a deal with the developer. The, the agreement's been reached. It's been rubber stamped by the court and uh, the, uh, the developer in the end has got largely what they want. And it's happened in my area too with the, uh, the uh, multi-storey retirement village that, that has occurred in, in, uh, in my ward at, uh, at Loda as well. Now Councillor uh, Atwood though, she's... Uh, uh, Councillor Atwood has quoted in, the, in that last uh, article in the uh, Courier Mail says, Councillor Davoy Lisa Atwood, who opposed the application publicly from the start, said she was angered by the decision. Council's refusal of the Brisbane, but this is, this is, now she's still angered by the decision. Council's refusal of the Brisbane Polo Grounds proposal followed significant community feedback. And to say I'm frustrated and disappointed with the court's approval would be an understatement, she said. She would be understood. So here she is, a member of the administration. They've settled the case. They've reached agreement with the developer, but she's saying she's still opposed to it. I mean, you know, fair dinkum. I, what, 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 what would have been better for Doughboy was if she wasn't the councillor anymore. That's what would have been better. If Joe Colshaw was the councillor. That, that's what would have been better. That's what would have been better. Doughboy, Doughboy might have got some decent representation. They, 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 never, they never got it under Councillor Murphy, so they, this, this is their chance to get some decent representation. So, <laughs> thank you. What say so you think she's beatable then? You think? Uh, thanks, thanks, that Councillor Murphy. Um, so uh, anyhow, so that's uh, that's my points. And uh, councillor, you know, uh, councillor uh, Atwood, uh, as a fresh young councillor, she's in fact a bit of a, a uh, I'd call a slippery fish uh, in terms of a very uh, well a well practiced a well practiced uh, councillor who knows exactly what's happening and uh, and wants to make herself appear different to what she is. But anyhow, I will I will go on to talk about the uh, Wyndham Fringe Festival on the weekend, which was a great festival. Uh, uh, I pay particular tribute to the uh, to the organiser, Mr. Tom Oliver. He uh, is a uh, talented young performer in his own right. He's only 25 years old, and uh, he's had with as most. Uh, performers in the live music industry. He's had very little income this year uh, and he's put this show together in under two months and he uh, deliberately made sure that the uh, 
performers were from close to Brisbane, so they didn't have to travel too far. So you've got people from Brisbane, Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast. Uh, he put together a, a substantial number of acts. There's 30 ticketed acts, and of those, 22 were sold out. And uh, that, that's a great effort. The ticket prices range from uh, 20 bucks to, to $50. And the, the $50 one was the, one of the ones that was sold out. There were many free shows for people to come along to as well. There were, uh, there were a number of stages in the, with one of the streets in Wynnum and the main business streets was closed off. There was, uh, the main stage was there. Up, up some of the little alleyways in between the buildings uh, and surrounding streets, there was other stages there, and people really uh, loved the shows and enjoyed it. And uh, so you didn't have to spend any money if you didn't want to, but if you did, you could come along and get some other uh, uh, performances as well. Uh, the, the main area where the performances took place was in the, uh, the old Baptist church buildings in, in Wynnum. They haven't been occupied now, I reckon, for at least 10 years. Uh, one was an old church hall, and one was the actual, the old church building. And uh, they were both had stages in them, and they were uh, excellent venues. And it was a great use of uh, of uh, an ageing infrastructure, but but uh, infrastructure that was still well and truly uh, able to be used for that purpose. And also, one of our local dance schools, Callaghers Dance School, uh, they also uh, allowed their premises to be used, and a number of performances uh, took place there as well. So, so uh, it was great use of uh, community facilities. Uh, it'd be great to see it all again next year. I'll be doing whatever I can to see it again next year because I think with the uh, limited amount of time to publicise the event, the numbers of people that came, there were a lot of uh, Winter Manly people there, I could, a lot of familiar faces, but there were also a lot of people from other parts of Brisbane, I believe, came for the performances as well. And uh, it, was, it was great. And one I pay particular tribute to is a group that I hear uh, regularly in my office. It's the... Uh, the ukulele band, the local ukulele band, uh, run by a group called Each. Each provide activities for elderly people, and uh, one of their activities is a ukulele band, and uh, they, uh, they perform in the room next to, to, to me, and I can hear them playing their tunes through the wall, and I, I, I resist the temptation normally, but it's occasionally I start singing along with them as well, sort of thing. But they didn't want to have their performance wrecked, so I didn't offer to sing on the, uh, on the day. But uh, they were very well supported, and uh, it, it was a great effort. There were local groups involved. Councillor Cumming, your, your time has expired. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. I rise to speak tonight on some local community champions and new library services that are coming into Callumvale Ward. So um, I'd like to start with uh, saying a very special thank you, Councillor Howard, for the pop-up library, which made its first appearance in Pallara um, in the Parklands two weeks ago, and it's coming back to um, this Thursday. I must say that the response from the local community was very, very positive, and uh, they really appreciated the way that the library staff actually worked with them and because my ward is so multiculturally diverse it is wonderful to see the different cultures coming together for the pop-up library and seeing the the looks on the young mother's faces, knowing that there are other young mums there that they can interact with and, and get to know some other people in the community. I think it's a really, really important way that we're not just saying, here's a library service. It's a community service in the true sense of the word. It's about bringing people together. It's reducing so social isolation in such a positive way. So um, I can never speak highly enough of the wonderful library staff and the work that they do. And I don't sing with them at sing-along time because I don't have dulcet tones like some of them do. But um, certainly I do get involved and uh, I am well attuned to, to reading The Very Cranky Bear and we're going on a bear hunt. And it's always such fun and it's so enjoyable being out there with, with the wonderful library staff. And I know that because we received such a positive response, these pop-up library sessions in the Pallara Parklands are going to be extraordinarily popular in the weeks and months and years to come. I'd also like to speak tonight about some local community champions. And these are a, two groups of ladies who fly under the radar. 
They do not go out to seek any, any recognition for themselves. They come together to share a love of knitting and crocheting. And so I'm talking about the Southside Community Craft Circle and also the Forest Lake Knitters and Crocheters. So the Southside Community Craft Circle have been going for over 10 years and I have supported them from the very beginning. And recently, as of yesterday, I gave them a new batch of um, yarn to get uh, back into the swing of things. And they are so appreciative. They do a lot of work. They make trauma teddies. They do blankets for the elderly. They help children in care. And when we had the bushfires earlier this year, they converted to making things like little um, orphaned wildlife pouches for the koalas, for the possum babies, etc. And they also make beanies for the homeless. And as well as that, the Forest Lake Knitters and Crocheters have been meeting once a week at Heathwood Park in my ward, and they're finding it extremely, um, extremely uplifting to be out in a park setting in an extraordinarily large shelter and being able to be there together and sit and chat, be socially distanced, but have the value of the fresh air and the park environment. And I know that when I bumped into them um, a couple of months ago, I said, look, I'm happy to support you and provide you with some, some wool because you are doing a fantastic service, not only for the people who are receiving the goods that you are actually putting your heart and soul and energy into um, creating, but also for the work that they're doing for one another, by keeping in touch with one another, making sure that from a well-being perspective, they're looking after each other. And this goes a very, very long way. It shows how much they care for not only the members of their group, but also the wider community. So whilst they don't go out to seek any recognition whatsoever, I think it is important to recognise these quiet achievers in our community, to say thank you for what you're doing out of the goodness of your heart and the kindness and compassion that you have for others. And I think that this is a very important tale that we can tell in this chamber because these are real people who exhibit the real spirit of Brisbane. Thank you. Thank you, councillors. Are there any further speakers? There being no one getting to their feet, I declare the meeting closed. <laughs>